for mainstream Australia. Thank you, Senator McGrath. We will now move to question time. Senator Wong, I will just address the issue you raised yesterday before we start. S Senator Wong, you did raise a point of order and you did ask me to come back to the chamber on it. Yesterday, I undertook to review the Hansard in relation to a point of order raised by the Leader of the Opposition in the Senate, Senator Wong, and come back to the Senate. The point of order related to the requirement in Standing Order 72 that answers must be directly relevant to the questions asked. Previous rulings make clear that a minister cannot simply answer the question at the beginning of their response and then talk about matters that are not directly relevant for the remainder of their time. Every part of an answer must be directly relevant to the question. It is my intention to continue applying those rulings and I have done so. I have also previously observed that a glancing phrase in an answer is not going to make someone not directly relevant, but that an answer that consisted of simply attacking the opposition would not be directly relevant. After points of order on the first supplementary question, I brought the minister back to the question. However, the point of order I undertook to review was taken in respect to Senator's Wong's, Senator Wong's second supplementary question, which asked the minister, in his representative capacity, his opinion on the views of his colleagues. Past rulings have indicated that where a question is politically loaded, a minister is entitled to some wider latitude to address the terms, assertions and imputations in the question. I would view a question asking for an opinion in a representative capacity of the views of others is also allowed a similar latitude. A point of order was also taken on the Leader of the Government not facing the Chair when answering questions. Uh, as I said at the time, there was no point of order. The requirement in the standing orders is about language, not body language, requiring remarks to be addressed to the Chair. I am perfectly comfortable with all Senators looking to the Chamber whilst addressing their remarks to me. Senator Wong. Thank you. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Why did the Morrison-Joyce government this morning refuse to pass a motion in the Senate which noted with concern, and I quote, increasing reports of threats of violence from an extreme element of society towards health workers, health officials, premiers and other parliamentarians? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Well, Mr President, let me deal firstly with the uh, specific facts in relation to uh, the motion, and Senator Wong has uh, carefully worded her question around uh, why did the government refuse to pass, not why did the government oppose, and, uh, and that is, of course, because the motion itself was never actually put to the chamber. Uh, the motion itself was not put to the chamber because the government, as we have consistently done, uh, as we have consistently done uh, since uh, the temporary orders in relation to motions were put through this chamber, uh, opposed an attempt to vary the order of business at the commencement of proceedings. We have consistently done that uh, each and every time, I believe, uh, there has been a move to do so uh, since the change of those temporary orders. Uh, that is uh, simply the government's position in relation uh, to, uh, to the way in which Senate business is managed. Uh, had the opposition uh, sought uh, by other means to raise those issues, uh, then, uh, then no doubt the government would have been in a position to consider the motion on its merits and in terms of the content of the motion Mr President, uh, can I say uh, that the government does condemn all acts of extremism and violence? The, do the government does condemn acts that seek to incite violence in any way uh, towards any of those uh, engaged in our public debate, towards any of those engaged in public service, towards any of those Australians going about their ordinary lives in a peaceful way. Can I say, Mr President, on such topic that in this place the content, the tone, the manner in which we all engage is important. Much of the debate this week seems to have centred around issues of extremism but also issues of personal attacks uh, around this chamber or across the parliamentary body. They do not help to Minister, elevate the debate. Minister, they do not help us to stay on the issues. Expired. Senator Wong, a supplementary question? Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. I, I also uh, say to the minister the, the motion that he, he and his party refused to pass included this. 
uh, condemned those in public office who have, for their own political gain, sought to diminish the collective achievements of Australians by dividing the nation, stoking anger and fear, inciting violence or lending sympathy to the actions of ideologically motivated extremists. Why did you refuse to pass that? And I invite you to indicate what would be required for you to Senator, enable you to support such, such a motion. Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. And Mr. President, uh, I do, as I did in the previous answer, uh, condemn those who engage in violence or who incite violence, whatever walk of life they come from, be they, uh, be they public officials, members of parliament, or indeed others uh, who do so. Mr. President, uh, in relation to the motion itself, uh, I was very clear uh, in the primary answer. Uh, that uh, the government was simply operating with the same convention we have uh, for uh, any motions that have come forward uh, at that time. The opposition has taken a different approach, sometimes supporting suspension, sometimes not, sometimes proposing it. That's the opposition's perspective. Uh, the government's view was when we took the motions policy reforms in this place, uh, we ought to then also ensure that we are held to a consistent approach in that regard, and we have done so. Uh, of course, motions put through the normal processes uh, the government will consider uh, in terms of when they Minister, come up in this chamber. Minister, Senator Wong, a second supplementary. Thank you, Mr President. Will the minister agree to jointly move and debate this motion next week? Minister. Well, Mr President, uh, I'm always happy to, uh, to engage in discussions with, uh, with those around the chamber uh, in relation to matters that have progressed in good faith. I'm always happy uh, to, uh, to ensure that we can, where necessary, come together to make unifying statements um, on behalf of the parliament uh, and the nation. Uh, that's important that we do that. Uh, I don't uh, much like a uh, process that engages in stunts. Uh, I do think, Mr President, that it is also important uh, that in doing so uh, we work cooperatively in relation to the text of such matters. That has been the case on many, many occasions in relation to statements that are sought to be pursued in a bipartisan context, uh, and of course I would respond constructively uh, if we wanted to, uh, to work through that process. Uh, I do think, Mr President, that whilst celebrating Australia's enormous achievements in relation to COVID, uh, we do need to acknowledge there have been debates around policy responses to COVID. Uh, it's legitimate to debate policy responses, Minister, but never Minister, to do so in a violent way. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Women's Safety, Senator Rustin. How is the Liberal and Nationals government boosting the capacity of frontline domestic violence services? Minister for Women's Safety, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Chandler for that question. This government, the Morrison-Joyce government, is absolutely focused on making sure that we have an Australia that is free of violence. And that's why in the budget this year, the 21-22 budget, we committed the largest amount of money, $1.1 billion package, to ensure women's safety. Um, this is a historic package, is a, a down payment to make sure that we move towards zero violence in this country. But we know every Australian has a role to play in ending violence, and that's why we have committed a $260 million package to work with the states and territories to make sure that they are able to provide frontline services, making sure that they are providing opportunities for their frontline workers and also developing and increasing capacity in the family and domestic violence sector. Uh, in providing this commitment as a partnership to the states and territories, this $260 million partnership over two years that's a lot more than $153 million over four years, ensures money goes to where it needs to be on the ground. This commitment builds on the $130 million that we provided states and territories to get them through the COVID pandemic this year and enable them to be able to deal with the unfortunate increase in demand that we saw during the COVID pandemic. Um, this has supported 450 frontline operations and employed hundreds of new people into this sector to make sure that women and children across the country are receiving the services that they need. 
We know that the next national plan to end violence against women and their children must be more than words, which is why I was disappointed this morning to hear Senator McAllister claim the government had shown little energy or interest in this issue. That is blatantly untrue. I give you my commitment that this government will work and continue to work in a non-partisan way to make sure that we end all forms of violence against women and their children in this country. I urge you to do the same. Senator Chandler, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank the Minister for her response. Minister, how will the government ensure accountability under the next national plan? Minister. Thank you very much, Mr President. Um, the next national plan will be an ambitious blueprint to end family, domestic and sexual violence, mm -hmm. and it must be more than words. Yeah, yeah. That is why we're investing $22.4 million over the next five years to establish a domestic family and sexual violence commission. The Commission will oversee the implementation of the next national plan with the responsibility for monitoring and reporting on accountability and making sure that we are measuring and evaluating the outcomes that we seek in this space. It will be to support the government in developing and fostering relationships across the whole sector, between governments of all levels, state and territory, mm -hmm. local governments, and making sure that we are working with the sector, but most importantly, that we are working with victim survivors so that we can understand exactly what they need. It is vital to ensure the next national plan delivers real and tangible outcomes on the ground for women and children in Australia who are the victims of this Minister. violence. Senator Chandler, a second supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, how is the government ensuring the next national plan to end violence against women and their children is inclusive for all victims of family, domestic and sexual violence? Minister. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, we have embarked over the last 18 months through the COVID pandemic with a multi-layered consultation approach to ensure all Australians have the opportunity to participate and be involved in ending violence against women and their children, in fact, ending violence, gender-based violence across Australia. Uh, there was an inquiry conducted in the, the House of Representatives, uh, the Standing Committee on Social Policy and Legal Affairs, which received over 300 submissions into their inquiry. We have conducted two public surveys, workshops and interviews with stakeholders and established the National Plan Advisory Group as well as the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island Advisory Group. The National Summit on Women's Safety brought together as a culmination all of these forms of consultation and brought together representatives of over 200 organisations so that they could take part in the discussions to inform the next national plan. Most importantly, victim survivors were invited to participate in this because it, their voices must be front and centre of the next national plan. Senator Keneally. Thank you. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. On Monday, I asked the Minister about a photo posted by LNP MP George Christensen of Victorian Premier Dan Andrews on his Telegram account, inciting violent comments threatening Premier Andrews' life. These posts were drawn to the attention of the AFP. The Minister took my question on notice. I asked again yesterday, but the Minister still did not have an answer. Can he today advise what action Mr Morrison has taken in response to Mr Christensen's online activity? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, Mr President, uh, I can, uh, can certainly confirm to the Senate uh, that the Prime Minister has, uh, has discussed uh, online activity and the need for responsibility in online activity with the Member for Dawson. Uh, as it is well known, the Prime Minister has, uh, has indeed um, in national and public comments urged all Australians to show uh, responsibility in relation uh, to their engagement online, Mr President. Uh, the, uh, the, um, as I understand it, uh, the type of comments uh, that, uh, that Senator Keneally refers to um, were posted by others uh, in response uh, to uh, the Senators, uh, in response to the member for Dawson's uh, posts. Uh, as we all know, uh, sadly, uh, in maintaining um, uh, social media accounts with avenues for people to make comment, um, there are uh, times in which people make comments that they should not make. Uh, if those comments have been referred to the AFP, uh, then it is rightly a matter for the AFP uh, to conclude, to conclude uh, the uh, investigations that uh, they are undertaking if they are doing so in relation to any such comments. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Uh, first, Mr President, I seek leave to table the post from the member for Dawson. Is leave granted? 
Thank Leave you. Is granted. On Monday, the minister said he was unaware that Mr. Christensen had posted a video of Catherine King, MP, which incited threatening comments directed at Ms. King, and that post was drawn to the attention of the AFP. I asked again yesterday, but the minister still did not have an answer. Has the, can the minister advise that whether Mr. Morrison has taken any uh, action in relation to Mr. Christensen in relation to these threats against Ms. King? Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks, thanks, Mr. President. Um, Mr. President, I would draw the senator's attention to the answer I just gave. Uh, that answer uh, covers um, the posts in question uh, and uh, and the uh, discussions that have been had and the actions that are rightly in the domain of the AFP. Senator Keneally, a second supplementary question. Uh, again, I, I seek leave to table documents relating to the issue regarding Ms. King. There's um, leave granted. The post from Mr. Do the member Dawson. Thank you. Leave is granted. Thank you. Given the Commissioner of the Australian Federal Police revealed on Monday he has been investigating various threats against parliamentarians, and yesterday WA Premier Mark McGowan disclosed threats to behead him and his family were recently made, why has it taken this minister two days to answer questions on this serious issue? Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. Mr. President, um, uh, it is. It is completely uh, unacceptable uh, and right of condemnation uh, and worthy of condemnation uh, when uh, threats are made against any Australian, including, of course, those of us you know, who serve in public office uh, and public life. Uh, far too many of us have, uh, have seen uh, such threats, violent action, have had to engage with those who work so hard uh, to, uh, to help to protect us as they do to help to protect uh, the nation through our different law enforcement agencies. And, uh, and I place on record my thanks, and I know the thanks of all senators who've had to engage uh, with the AFP uh, or with any other uh, home affairs or other agencies in relation uh, to uh, protection on such matters. Uh, uh, in, uh, in relation to uh, the issues uh, that Senator Keneally raises, uh, as you indicated, the AFP uh, may be looking into certain Minister, matters there. They're the Minister, right authority to do so. Your time for the answer has expired. Senator Mullen. Thank you, Mr. President. And my question is to the Attorney General, Senator Cash. Can the Attorney General inform the Senate how the Liberal and Nationals government is protecting the Australian way of life and ensuring Australians remain safe from ever evolving threats of terrorism? The Attorney General, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Mullen for his question. And of course, I acknowledge uh, his service in helping to keep our country safe. Uh, Mr. President, the coalition government's first priority is to keep our community safe from those who seek to do us harm. Since September 2014, when the national terrorism threat level was raised, 144 people have been charged as a result of 71 counter-terrorism related operations around Australia. 21 major counter-terrorism disruption operations have been undertaken in response to potential or imminent attack planning in Australia. And sadly, nine Australians have lost their lives. Mr President, we know our law enforcement and security agencies are among the best in the world, but we have to ensure that they have the powers that they need. That is why, since 2014, our government has now passed 29 tranches of national security legislation. And this legislation, of course, has been crucial in providing our law enforcement and security agencies the framework and powers needed to identify, target and disrupt those who seek to do harm to Australia, Australians and our way of life. However, we now have a significant challenge that has been facing our counter-terrorism efforts in recent years. Currently, there are 18 convicted terrorists who are due for release over the next five years and can still pose a very significant risk to the Australian community. But that is why our government has methodically built a world-leading framework to effectively manage those persons over the coming years. We can't eliminate entirely the risk of terrorism more than we can eliminate the risk of any serious crime. However, we can Minister, take appropriate Minister, action. Your time has expired. Senator Molan, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. 
Uh, uh, to, to the Attorney General again, uh, how does the recent passage of high risk terrorist offenders legislation build and expand on the framework that is provided to our law enforcement and security agencies to manage high risk offenders and protect Australians? Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. President. And as we know from our security and our law enforcement agencies, terrorist offenders are typically highly radicalised and often do not change their extremist views whilst they are in prison. Recent tragic events in New Zealand and the United Kingdom remind us of the real and present threat that these offenders do indeed pose. The high-risk terrorist offenders legislation introduces extended supervision orders as another tool to keep Australians safe from terrorists. The extended supervision orders will ensure offenders are subject to close supervision and specific conditions tailored to the level of risk that they themselves pose. These will complement the current regime of control orders and continuing detention orders that are used to ensure the community is kept safe by managing terrorists after their jail term ends. Senator Mullen, a second supplementary question. In addition to managing individual offenders, attorney, what is the government doing in relation to the organisation that organisations that plan, finance and carry out terrorist acts? Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. President, and the Morrison Joyce government continues to keep Australians safe from terrorism and from violent extremism, and today we would have seen Minister Andrews announce the intention to list the base and the entirety of Hezbollah as terrorist organisations under the Criminal Code. Listing the base and Hezbollah as a terrorist organisation under the Criminal Code sends a clear message that the Australian government condemns the actions of groups that use terrorism to achieve their political, religious or ideological objectives. The listings will enable the application of terrorist organisation offences to these groups and align Australia with international partners such as the United Kingdom and Canada. By listing the terrorist organisations, it enables penalties of up to 25 years imprisonment, including if you are a member of training with or providing Minister, terrorist support to the organisations. Your time has expired. Senator Griff. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to Senator McKenzie, representing the Minister for Agriculture. Minister, in the first week of November, state and federal agricultural ministers met and considered the recommendations of the Pet Food Working Group. This meeting came a staggering four years after dozens of dogs started dying after consuming a brand of dry kibble and exactly three years after the Senate handed down its report on regulatory approaches to ensure the safety of pet food. As usual, there was no outcome from the November meeting. Apparently, ministers are now going to wait on a cost-benefit analysis of some kind. Minister, why is the federal government and the state and territory counterparts not acting with greater urgency and instead acting like an errant new puppy by chewing up the paperwork, dropping the ball and running away from taking urgent action? The minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. I do thank Senator Griff uh, for his question and for his ongoing interest uh, in this serious issue. My advice from uh, the Minister for Agriculture <laughs> is that there does uh, remain a high level of community interest in the safety of pet food following the pet food incidents in 2018 and more recently in Victoria. Um, there was a pet food working group established with agreement of all agriculture ministers and they welcomed the Senate inquiry into the pet food industry in 2018. That working group has developed a range of regulatory and non-regulatory options for consideration, as you say, by state and territory <coughs> governments. Um, ABARES has also updated its 2012 report on the economic assessment of policy options to manage pet food safety in Australia. And the report includes options for self-regulation, co-regulation and uh, full government regulation. The reports of the Pet Food Working Group and ABARES were considered by agriculture senior officials on the 16th of September 2021 and again on the 30th of September 2021. 
It was agreed that a cost-benefit analysis of all po the policy options would be undertaken before making recommendations to ministers on which options should be pursued. And Senator, as you would be, as you would appreciate, decisions of this nature that do go to uh, state and territories regulatory frameworks do need to be able to assess how much it will cost, what are going to be the unforeseen circumstances of uh, regul if we go the full regulatory option, uh, who's going to bear the cost for that and what are the implications for state and territory ministers as they consider uh, adopting those regulatory frameworks. So given your um, usual concern about the efficient use of taxpayer spending, I'm... Minister, the time for your answer has expired. Senator Griff, a supplementary question. Uh, Minister, four years is a very long time to get to the point of even considering a cost-benefit analysis. And I'm not sure how a cost-benefit analysis will be accepted by people who've uh, lost uh, uh, many pets over many years. But can you detail what reforms are actually on the table and what changes pet owners can expect to see? Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And, uh, Senator, I do recognise the grief uh, that is caused by losing pets, particularly uh, around this type of um, issue uh, that could be avoided. Um, and I assure you that the Commonwealth is taking its uh, role in this very, very seriously. But as you would appreciate, working with states and territory uh, ministers um, can have its challenges in harmonising regulations across uh, the different areas of government. Um, so the other uh, issue that I'm advised has been undertaken is a review of the Australian standard for manufacturing and marketing of pet food. Um, that was also supported by the agricultural senior officials, as well as jurisdictions, industry and other key stakeholders. I think it's important to note that this process has been conducted in a careful and considered matter, manner uh, in consultation with all the relevant stakeholders, and there's not been consensus on the best option uh, for uh, state and territory ministers Minister, to pursue. Your time has expired. Senator Griff, a second supplementary. Uh, Minister, would any of the measures currently undergoing this cost-benefit analysis, uh, in your view, actually prevent future deaths of pets from unsafe food? Minister. Uh, well, as you know, Senator Griff, I uh, represent the Minister for Agriculture. Um, I'm not the Minister themselves, so I'm acting on advice, but I'm confident that all Ministers involved uh, want to see a positive resolution to this. Uh, my understanding is uh, the Commonwealth Agriculture Minister has written to state and territory ministers and asked that they consider the outcomes of that review into the Australian standards of manufacturing, um, that they consider that uh, and that the desire of many for a positive outcome for pets and pet owners when deciding the best way forward. Um, he has also concluded the Pet Food Review Working Group and thanked all the members for their participation. And he anticipates that the reports from that working group and ABEARS will be made public by the end of this year, um, as responsibility for the domestic oversight for pet food sits with the jurisdictions. This will ultimately be a decision for state and territory ministers whether to adopt a mandatory regulatory framework or continue Minister, to operate under the current Minister, framework. your time has expired. Uh, we now go to Senator Macdonald. My question is to the Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator Mackenzie. Can the Minister outline how the Liberal and National Government's plan is contributing to the economic security of regional and remote Australia by supporting jobs, businesses and investment? The Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator Mackenzie. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Macdonald for her question. As she knows from her on-ground experience in Queensland, particularly the North, Regional Australia is experiencing a once-in-a-generation surge in economic growth. And this is all the while these communities are recovering from the effects of the COVID pandemic, drought and other natural disasters over the recent period. A combination of high commodity prices, strong overseas demand for our agriculture and resources, uh, a good rainfall in most of rural Australia are factors that are contributing to a positive economic outlook which translates into jobs and a higher standard of living for all Australians. But while this economic recovery is good news for the people of rural and regional Australia, this success didn't just come about by accident. The Liberal and Nationals government has been investing and delivering in thousands of projects on the ground to help lay the groundwork for our farmers, fishers, foresters, miners and small businessmen and women 
for the great work they do in the country. And we are ensuring our economy, economy continues to grow with low interest rates, low taxes and high, higher and higher employment. We are also experiencing an unprecedented population shift from our congested capital cities to regional areas that has set a net migration of 45,000 Australians moving to regional towns and cities. And this means stronger, more resilient and more vibrant regional centres. Our government's investment includes a record $110 billion in infrastructure projects in road and rail and a 1,700-kilometre inland rail to better connect our regional communities and shift product to capital cities, ports and overseas. We spent $3.5 billion on building dams and pipelines and weirs so that we use our precious water resources more efficiently. And we've put $5 billion back into communities for drought resilience. In my own areas of responsibility too, we as a government have made available $2.5 billion to support Minister, those communities impacted Minister, by Black your time black has expired. Senator Macdonald, a supplementary question. Can the minister outline how this will support Australia's economic recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic? Minister. We know that much of Australia's economic output is as a result of the hard work, ingenuity and commitment of the men and women who live and work in remote and regional Australia. Our investments in infrastructure, connectivity and resilience support these communities to prosper not only in the short term but for many, many years to come. Eight out of Australia's top ten exports are produced in regional, rural and remote areas. Ag exports alone have grown to $306 billion a year when we came to power uh, in 2012 to $476 billion in 2019-20. Australia's resources and energy export industry grew from $178 billion when we came to power uh, to $310 billion uh, in 2021. That represents a 74 per cent increase over this period. And sovereign manufacturing, from food manufacturing to defence manufacturing, are also growing at a record levels. Our government economic management and regionalisation Minister, strategy is making a Minister, significant contribution to expired. our economic Senator Macdonald, a second supplementary question. Can the minister outline any risks to our economic recovery if our regions are not supported to prosper and the impact this would have on the broader Australian economy? Minister. Well, unfortunately, Mr President and Senator Macdonald, I can identify a risk, and it is the risk of electing Anthony Albanese and the Labor Party, who hand in hand with Adam Bant and his green eco-warriors, who will choose to decimate not only our agriculture and our mining industries, but the ultimate renewable industry, the great Australian forest industry. The timber workers and the timber processing workers right across this country have much to fear from the election of the Labor Party, led by Anthony Albanese and Larissa Water, Nick McKim and all their mates with Adam Bant, uh, the green policies that will be adopted as a result of their coalition government. So when you talk to the millions of people that live out in rural and regional Australia, the, great, the greatest risk to the economic recovery to the regions and indeed to the nation is that side of politics that has no respect for the regions or Minister, the industries that underpin our economies. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, President. My question is to the Minister for Women's Safety, Minister Rustin. The Women's Safety Summit statement was clear. Affordable and accessible short and long term housing is fundamental so that women aren't having to choose between violence or homelessness. Commissions may be useful, but how many additional houses or crisis accommodation places will the Domestic Family and Sexual Violence Commissioner announced overnight create? Where is the funding to put a roof over people's heads and ensure that victim survivors have somewhere safe to go when they escape? And does the government support national tenancy protections for victim survivors? The Minister for Women's Safety, Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank um, Senator Waters for her question and for her ongoing interest in this really, really vital area of Australian policy. Um, the coalition government, of which I am the Minister for Women's Safety, is absolutely committed to put in place a range of measures to make sure we support women who are making that extraordinarily brave decision to leave a violent relationship. Part of that package obviously has to make sure that there is a safe place for them to go. Um, so far in both the 2021-22 uh, the budget, 
in the fourth action plan, we have actually provided um, support to the states and territories, particularly in rural and regional Australia, um, a program called Safe Places, which has provided uh, accommodation for 6,500 women and children escaping violence every year so that they can have a safe place to go. In addition to that, we are also working with the states and territories around a program called Keeping Women Safe in Their Home, because we need to change the dial here. Instead of making the victim survivors the ones that are the ones that suffer the pain, we need to make sure that the perpetrators are held to account. And the best way to hold a perpetrator to account when it's safe to do so is make him leave the home so that she and the children can stay there, so they can stay with the support mechanisms of their family, their friends and their school, and they don't have to leave with nothing. But only when it's safe to do so. We also announced as part of the 21-22 budget the Escaping Violence Payment. Uh, it's a two-year program that we're trialling to make sure that we get it right, uh, but that $164 million plus program provides $5,000 to women who are leaving a violent relationship so that they can have the necessities to be able to set up a safe new home for themselves mm -hmm. and in the case of when they have children, their children. Um, and one of the things that we have heard very, very clearly is the fact that putting down a bond on a new place to be able to rent sometimes is the most important thing that women are requiring that assistance for. We will continue to work with you, Senator Waters, and everybody else to Minister, end violence against women and their children. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Waters, a supplementary question. Thanks, President. The second edition of Our Watch's toolkit, Change the Story, was released today. It confirms the need to address the drivers of violence against women. Will the government fund comprehensive, expert-led, respectful relationships programs from early childhood education onwards to dismantle the rape culture and gender stereotyping at the heart of gendered violence? Minister. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, Senator Ward is one of the absolutely fundamental things that we have to do as part of the next national plan is not to just provide support for response. Um, albeit a very important component of what we do in addressing um, gender-based violence. But we have to stop it before it starts. That's absolutely... The, it, prevention is the number one thing that we must do. Because if we genuinely are going to end violence against women and their children, we actually have to stop it from happening in the first place. So it's extremely important that we put in place a number of programs. And to your point in relation to um, consent and respectful relationships, they are the absolute fundamental underlier on making sure that we have a country that is free from violence. Because as we all know, that whilst all disrespectful behaviour does not end up in violence, we can be absolutely assured that every single circumstance of domestic, family and sexual violence mm -hmm. starts with a disrespectful action. We must address that in the next plan. Senator Waters, a second supplementary question. Thanks, President. The women's safety sector have been calling for an investment of $12 billion over 12 years as part of the new national plan to meet existing demand as well as projected service demands. The government's commitments to date and overnight fall well short of that. Can the minister confirm whether the government ever intends to lift its contribution so that family, domestic and sexual violence services are not for forced to turn people away when they seek help? Minister. Thank you very much, uh, very much Mr. Mr President. Well, I think that the, this government's um, record um, stands very strongly in that uh, in May this year, the 2021-22 budget uh, made a down payment on the next national plan of $1.1 billion, the largest ever investment in women's safety that this country has ever seen. And that is running in parallel to the final stages and the expenditure of the fourth action plan, as well as ongoing measures, for instance, 1800 Respect, which is an ongoing measure that's funded into the future. So I think this government um, has shown a very strong commitment to making sure that the resources are available, uh, not just, uh, as you talk about, in terms of responding to the horrible situation in relation to uh, domestic violence, but making sure that we deal um, with prevention, early intervention and also the recovery so that we make sure that we're providing the resources on the whole journey Order. that we see through domestic violence. Because I'd like to think, Senator Waters, that you and I were on a unity ticket to end violence against women and, Minister, and their children. Minister, your time has expired. I would remind senators on my left that interjections are always disorderly. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health. Earlier this month, the community of Woodner in South Australia were advised by their local doctor, Dr Scott Lewis, that he was leaving, no longer able to tolerate working in a system, and I quote, 
with so little respect for its frontline medical and nursing staff. He'll be relocating to Adelaide at the end of the year. What is the government doing to remedy his concerns about the lack of respect and the lack of support? What is the government doing to ensure continuity of service in Woodna after Dr Lewis leaves? What will the cost of that continuity of service be to the government? And what is the uh, government doing to replace Dr Lewis? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, thanks, Senator, for the question and uh, of some notice of the topic of the question, given its very local specificity, Mr President. Uh, Mr President, I can understand the concern of the residents of Woodna uh, losing their local GP. My understanding, having had a conversation with the uh, very, very good member for Grey, Mr Ramsey, uh, this afternoon, that uh, uh, the, the, doc the doctor, uh, Dr Lewis, actually only came for a short period of time to Woodna uh, and stayed for 15 years. Uh, he's given great service to that local community and I'm sure that the community are very sad to leave him, Mr President. Uh, and the issues in relation to attracting doctors to uh, regional areas is uh, a difficult one. It's many faceted. Uh, and I have to say I'm really quite proud of the work that this government's done in support of attracting doctors into regional areas. In the 1819 budget, we put $550 million into the Stronger Rural Health Strategy uh, and followed that up in last year's budget with another $123 million uh, supporting the implementation of that strategy, Mr President. Uh, and in that particular area, I'm aware that Mr Ramsey's been very active in working with his uh, colleagues, uh, Minister Hunt uh, and Minister Gillespie, uh, to work on local solutions. And I'm advised, Mr President, that uh, Minister Gillespie's also had a number of conversations, direct conversations, with the South Australian Mr. Minister for Health, Mr. Minister Wade, to see what the two governments can do together uh, in support of providing GP services in that local area. Uh, Mr President, I'm also aware that uh, Minister Hunt, following a conversation, provided $300,000 to support a report that's being done by the Northern Air Health Alliance, which will be handed Minister, to Minister Hunt very soon. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Patrick, a supplementary question. Sounds like a lot of uh, talk and not a lot of action at this point. Kimber has, own, uh, has had a, a doctor for only two of the last six years. Currently, they are being serviced by locums when those locums are available. Mayor Dean Johnson tells me that they have no doctor in Kimber this week, a week where South Australia is opening up its borders to COVID. What is the government doing to remedy this situation in Kimber? Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Can I say I do reject the allegation made at the outset of that question. Uh, I have to say Mr Ramsey has been uh, very actively working with his ministerial colleagues uh, and minister, minister, well, ministerial, ministerial colleagues working again closely with the uh, South Australian government. As I was just saying towards the end of my answer, um, Mr Ramsey secured $300,000 for the Northern Air Health Alliance to uh, undertake a piece of work to see what would be the most effective things in attracting and retaining doctors specifically in the Kimber region, Mr President. Uh, and so he's actually out there doing the job and working hard for his constituents. And I acknowledge, Senator Patrick, your concern for the community as well. Uh, and this is an important issue, but it is complex. Uh, and so we are working with that community, uh, providing them with resources to help uh, come to solutions and facilitate the attraction of doctors into those particular Minister, communities because we understand Minister, it's important. your time has expired. Senator Patrick, a second supplementary. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, Woodner and Kimber, 100 kilometres apart in the centre of the Air Peninsula, soon won't have a doctor in sight. Does the Minister accept that there is a real potential for death to occur from an incident or accident and the direct inability to respond with a qualified doctor in short time? Does the government accept that it will be responsible for deaths in these circumstances? Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, Senator, I think it's really unfortunate that you try and portray uh, any tragic incident that might occur in a local community in those circumstances. And there are other 
provisions that the government in place, including uh, specific arrangements with the Royal Flying Doctor Service, for example, that provide support into regional areas. But as I've said in my two uh, initial answers, there is direct action and act activity being undertaken by the local member uh, with local communities, with his ministerial colleagues uh, and the state government in efforts to attract doctors to the region, Mr President. Uh, Dr Lewis um, has not left yet, but has, has, I think, quite responsibly given the community some notice uh, that he is going to go. It gives the community, uh, uh, the government, state, federal and local, the opportunity to work together to see what they can do to attract uh, additional Minister, services to the region Minister, in a very complex your time uh, climate. Has expired. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Why did Mr Morrison tell the March for Justice protesters that they were lucky not to be met with bullets, but when protesters marched across Victoria, threatening to hang the Premier, including one with gallows, he spoke about how he understood their frustrations? He did say that. The Minister representing the Prime Minister. Order. Order. Minister, Minister, just resume your seat. We'll wait till the chamber is silent. The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Well, Mr President, uh, it is a problem in this place in relation to the way in which uh, questions are put and conduct occurs. Uh, when statements are taken significantly out of context. Uh, I do reject the premise of this question, Mr President, uh, and in doing so, uh, I note very Order much uh, that the left. Prime Minister, at the time, if my memory is correct, uh, was noting indeed in countries like Australia, which indeed is what makes the right of Senator all to is. protest in this country a safer one and should be a safe Senator one, unlike, unlike in so many other parts of the world, so tragically. But that, Mr President, shows, in terms of the context of this question, the extent to which those opposite seek to take the low road uh, in politics, the low road in politics, while on this side, on this side, Mr President, I note, I note, Mr President, the appalling absence of questions on Senator policy Walsh. issues from those opposite the appalling absence Senator the appalling absence of questions right. related to policy on Senator that side Walsh. we are proud as a government we are proud as a government uh, to be leading a country that has achieved some of the lowest fatality Senator rates from covid-19 some of the highest vaccination rates in relation to covid-19 and some of the strongest economic outcomes in managing through this disaster and challenge. We're proud as a Senator government, Ayers. Mr President, to have seen some 700,000 jobs come back from the worst stages of the COVID-19 economic hit. To see record numbers of apprenticeship commencements occurring as a result Order. of our policies. These are the types of policies those opposite could choose to ask about, but don't ask about. And because for them, for them, they choose to make it personal Minister, and they choose to take the low Minister, road. Your time has expired. Senator Walsh, a sub Senator, Senator Walsh, please resume your seat. Senator Wong, I'm attempting to give one of uh, the opposition's members the call, and you are interjecting across the chamber. Senator Walsh, a supplementary question. On the weekend, the protesters whose frustrations Mr Morrison said he understood heard from one speaker, and I quote, are we willing to go to the absolute end? Is it fair to say that we Order. will go to any length necessary to rid our parliament Order. of those traitorous politicians? Order. Are these the frustrations Mr Morrison says he understands? Of course they are. It, uh, sorry, just before I call you, Minister, interjections are always disorderly. I was, I was trying, no, I was trying to listen I was attempting to listen to the content of the question, which presumably you want me to do, Senator Wong, 
Minister, you have the call. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. Uh, well, the comments that were quoted clearly deserve condemnation. They have been condemned, uh, such comments, by the Prime Minister, by me, by many others, many times, continuously uh, during the course of events uh, since those protests occurred, Mr. President. And again, it's an example of those opposite uh, in terms of the type of character destruction they're trying to undertake, in terms of the personalisation of politics they're trying to undertake, uh, all to, of course, uh, cover up for the policy vacuum uh, that they have. Uh, Mr. President, those opposite, those opposite should reflect on the fact uh, that you know, they uh, are continuing to try Order. to seek to exacerbate uh, and to highlight uh, the types of problems and divisions that do not help us as a country. Uh, in terms of sensibly dealing with the challenges we face. And as a country, we have overwhelmingly, through COVID-19, dealt with issues sensibly and successfully as a nation. Oh, Minister, please resume your seat. Uh, Senator Walsh, a second supplementary question. The same speaker said at the protest, and I quote, there is no doubt in my mind that we are winning. Would protesters who are willing to go to any length necessary still think they were winning if they hadn't been backed by the Prime Minister of Australia. Order. Minister. Well, Mr President, I again reject the premise uh, of that question. Uh, the Prime Minister uh, was very clear, very clear in relation to his condemnation uh, of violence, very clear in relation Order. to the fact that it has no place in any protest, in any other such activity. Uh, nor uh, those seeking uh, to, uh, to provoke or promote acts of violence in any way. Uh, now, for those opposite who want to keep repeating and repeating and repeating a falsehood and an assertion, uh, that is a matter for them to explain why it is that rather than wanting to come into this place and debate uh, the issues for Australians around uh, their jobs, their lives, their, the many challenges that people face, which we pleasingly have seen them come through COVID-19 uh, in such a successful way, as I say, in some of the lowest fatality rates around the world in this country, some of the strongest economic outcomes, some of the highest vaccination rates. This is a testament to Minister, Australia's success. Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Brake. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Superannuation, Financial Services and Digital Economy, Senator Hume. Can the minister outline to the Senate how the government's director ID program is making it easier for small business to engage with government as we reopen the economy? The Minister for Superannuation, Senator Hume. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. I thank Senator Bragg for his question. Mr President, businesses large and small are at their most productive and competitive when they spend less time on paperwork and more time focused on what they do best. That's why the Morrison government's modernising businesses registered program will deliver a single entry point to streamline how businesses register, view and maintain information with the government. This new fast and easy to use platform announced as part of the Morrison government's digital business plan will bring together more than 30 ASIC registers and the Australian business register onto a new modern system at the ATO. A major component of this program is the establishment of director IDs. As of the 1st of November this year, Australia's 2.7 million company directors can now quickly and easily apply for their new director ID online using the Australian Business Registry Services website. This unique 15-digit identifier only takes minutes to apply for, but it will stay with a director for life, even as directors move between different roles, different businesses and even different countries. In a world of increasing identity theft and cyber security threats, Director ID offers far greater identity security than is currently available. More importantly, Mr President, Director ID will help to level the playing field for honest businesses. Mm. They will present the use of fictitious directors, help regulators trace directors' relationships with companies over many years and over time, and better identify director involvement in unlawful activities, such as illegal phoenix activity. To apply for a director ID, directors can very simply log on to the Australian Business Register service online using the MyGovID app. 
It's free to apply and available to directors within Australia and overseas. Applications can be made by phone, they can be made by paper and for those who need it, but the online application form takes only minutes to just to complete and their director ID is issued instantly. Senator Bragg, a supplementary uh, question. Thank you very much, Mr President. Order. I, I can't hear with the masks on. It's hard to hear the interjections. Well, interjections um, are always disorderly, Senator Well, there Bragg. you go. So See? That's let's, how, let's silence that, on my left, Senator what a, Bragg. What a tremendous time. Order. Can't hear you either, sorry. <laughs> Order, Senator Very good. O'Neill. That's a good zinger. <laughs> Sen well done. Senator O'Neill. I, I can't hear that either, sorry. Senator Bragg. Send us an email. I think, isn't this your time? Senator Bragg. Thank you very much. Senator Keneally. I've got enough time to read the question, so it'll be okay. Don't worry. Um, thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, can the minister detail to the Senate the uptake of director IDs to date? Minister. Thank you again, Senator Bragg. Mr President, since the 1st of November this year, in just the first two weeks of the rollout, we've seen more than 70,000 director IDs issued. 96 per cent of director ID applications have been digital. And the Australian Business Registry Services website has had over 500,000 unique page views since the beginning of November alone. Mr President, these are extraordinary figures, especially given the rollout is still in its public beta phase, and they're a testament to industry and the community's support for this particularly important program. And with 96 per cent of applications made digitally and online, it highlights businesses' support for this government's efforts to improve the efficiency of registry service transactions in online settings. Indeed, while the opposition will talk about illegal Phoenix activity, only the coalition government will actually address it. Senator Bragg, a second Thanks. supplementary question. Thanks very much, Mr President. Can the minister advise the Senate which stakeholders have said what about the measure and how it will help secure the recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic? Minister. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Bragg. Mr. President, the Australian business community has wholeheartedly supported and embraced the Director ID program as part of the Morrison government's commitment to cut red tape for business. The Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry said that the consolidation of business registers will simplify businesses' interactions with government and reduce duplication. Businesses need only tell government once. Similarly, the Australian Institute of Company Directors recognised the program's value as a flexible and technology neutral modern business registry, registry regime and its potential to stop criminal behaviour and illegal Phoenix activity. Director ID is just one of the many business focused solutions that the Morrison government is implementing to make doing business easier, fairer, faster and safer. And it's part of Australia's commitment to being a leading digital economy and society by 2030. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And uh, I rise to ask a question of the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. O on what date did Mr. Morrison first become aware of Mr. Christensen's posts, which incited threats of violence against Premier Andrews? and Catherine King. The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, thanks Mr President. Uh, Mr President, uh, uh, a few things in relation to, uh, to uh, this question. Uh, I'm not uh, aware of, uh, of precise dates in relation to those posts. As I said earlier in this week, uh, I certainly was only aware of them uh, when Senator Keneally asked. Um, uh, the next point I'd make, uh, Mr President, is, uh, is that uh, I think it is uh, uh, it is important that we are clear in relation to these matters. Uh, these, uh, apparently, and I've not seen the comments that Senator Keneally has been asking about during the week, but these are comments that have been made uh, on uh, Mr Christensen's posts, uh, not, uh, not, of course, the posts themselves in relation uh, to, uh, to uh, acts of violence. Um, Mr. Mr President, I also uh, wish while I'm on my feet uh, to correct the record in relation to the answer I gave Senator Keneally earlier today. Uh, I understand, as I indicated at the time, of course, the Prime Minister has publicly 
uh, urged all Australians to show responsibility in relation to social media platforms and the like in relation to conversations with uh, the member for Dawson about responsibility on social media platforms and the like. Those conversations have been had by the leader of the National Party, the Deputy Prime Minister. The Minister has completed his answer. Do you have a supplementary question, Senator O'Neill? I would hope that the Minister might take the last question on notice, seeing as he was unable to provide an answer to a very specific question. Um, my next question, uh, Deputy President, is another date. On what date did Mr Morrison discuss these posts with Mr Christensen, and was that via telephone or face to face? Minister. No. Um, Mr President, uh, I refer to the um, correction on the record I just gave to, uh, uh, to Senator O'Neill. Um, if there's uh, any information around uh, dates uh, of knowledge or the like, uh, I'll seek to bring that to the House. Senator O'Neill, a second oh, supplementary question. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr President, I actually couldn't hear Senator Birmingham's response. I was listening. I, I, I simply couldn't hear his response. I, I don't want to put words into the minister's mouth, but I believe he took it on notice if he could get you further information. Um, well, that was because there were interjections. So, <laughs> Senator O'Neill, a second supplementary question. So, uh, thank you. I do have a further supp supplementary question. Um, and is that that is will Mr Morrison ask Mr Christensen to remove his incendiary posts? And if not, why not? Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr President. Well, Mr President, uh, uh, as members of Parliament, uh, we are all responsible uh, for our own actions uh, and for those actions in terms of the way in which we engage. Mr President, Mr President. Order. In relation to uh, the member for Dawson, Order. it is well known that the member for Dawson uh, is a vocal participant in public debate. I again, Mr. President, I again, Order. Mr. President, do draw the distinction uh, between um, uh, the comments that Senator Keneally alleges Senator Keneally. Uh, have been posted, and of course, uh, on I'm sure nearly all of our different social media platforms, we have had cause at times to delete. Uh, comments uh, that, uh, that have been made that are completely inappropriate Order. and that deserve condemnation. And I would urge all of us, including the member for Dawson, uh, to be so vigilant in doing so. Notice. Yeah. Senator Cash, uh, Attorney General. I just need to correct a figure that I gave to Senator Molan in relation to an answer I provided. I said nine deaths, I meant nine attacks. Thank you. Uh, Senator, uh, Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I table a document relating to the order for production of documents oh, concerning the sorry, income compliance. Sorry, Sen sorry, Senator Faruqi. Mr. President, I seek leave to make a personal statement in relation to comments made earlier today by Senator Scar. The, the minister was on her feet. She can continue. You I can... was on my feet for ages. The minister was on her feet pursuant to an order of the Senate. I saw the minister on her feet before I saw Senator Faruqi. If, 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 if the minister wants to yield, she can. Uh, Senator Birmingham. If it may help, uh, Mr. President, indeed. Uh, I mean, se se Senator Reynolds is uh, is responding to an order of the Senate and uh, an attendance at the time that was so specified, and so Senator Reynolds is not doing anything wrong. Uh, Mr. President, I would uh, ask if it's Senator Reynolds is uh, is willing uh, that uh, that you grant the call to Senator Faruqi. Uh, she uh, she had um, requested to make a statement at the commencement of question time um, uh, under discussion. She had agreed to do so following question time, and I appreciate that cooperation. Thank you for that clarification. Thank you, Senator Reynolds. Senator Fruki, you have the call. Um, thank you, Mr. President. What Senator Scar did earlier today was sorry, a textbook sorry, exercise. Was, was leave okay. granted for a short statement? Two minutes has been granted. What Senator Scar did 
this morning was a textbook exercise in gaslighting and condescension. It should be condemned, and Senator Scar should be ashamed. At a time when far-right extremism is on the rise, when there has been a refusal by members of this government, including the Prime Minister, to unequivocally and directly condemn the far-right racist extremists embedded in the recent protests, Senator Scar instead chose to directly patronize me and call my motives into question. Senator Scar's assertions and insinuations that I and we on this side are dividing the country are absolutely contemptible. But this is what usually happens when you call, or call out far-right extremism and racism, as if we are the problem rather than racism and far-right extremism itself. We need to wake up to the harm that this is causing so many who live here. Senator Scar's assertion that bringing emotions such as this is playing politics, or constructing a straw man, is equally contemptible. This is an extremely serious matter. Just because white privileged men in here don't face abuse day in and day out doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Believe me, I wish I didn't have to get up here so often to talk about my community being under attack. I wish I didn't have to get up week in, week out and call on the government to reject racism and extremism rather than indulging in it. I wish I didn't have to talk about the abuse I face every day because of who I am. But it is the reality of my existence, and this is the reality of what is currently being normalized and, in fact, encouraged in this country. And it has to be addressed. Senator Scar should apologize for his gaslighting and his condescension. And the leader of the government in here should show leadership and make it clear that this is not acceptable. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy President. Uh, I table a document relating to the order for the production of documents concerning the income compliance program. Uh, Deputy President, the government does not make public interest immunity claims lightly and without careful consideration of the particular harm to the public interest. As I've previously advised the Senate, I have carefully reviewed the claim of public interest immunity and I recognise it would not be in the public interest to disclose the information over which the claim has been reiterated uh, to, in relation to the legal advice and also to the deliberations of Cabinet that relate to the income compliance program. And I will again summarise the basis on which this claim was made. As noted by the Federal Court, there remains individuals whose potential claims against the Commonwealth have not been extinguished. I'll say that again. Their claim has not been extinguished. This may include over 5,000 people who have opted out of the class action. Disclosing the information requested would obviously, obviously have the potential to prejudice the Commonwealth's ability to defend the claims. The claim over information relating to legal advice has been made on two grounds. Firstly, the long-held practice of claiming privilege over legal advice and associated documents obtained in the course of normal decision-making processes of government. And secondly, the possible prejudice to the Commonwealth in relation to its conduct of litigation relating to the income compliance program. The claim is grounded in the importance of government being able to obtain legal advice in relation to the normal decision-making functions without the risk of that advice or the information relating to that advice being disclosed. The availability of frank legal advice to decision-makers within government should be protected as a fundamental principle of good government. And to this very point, I note that the Federal Court has previously found the advice that are subject of this public interest immunity claim to be privileged legal advice. In fact, His Honour Justice Lee upheld the Commonwealth's claim of legal professional privilege in connection with every one of those documents subject of the challenge from Gordon Legal. Providing a copy, or, uh, sorry, providing a copy of or information about the minute requested would or could reasonably be expected to disclose the deliberations of Cabinet. By making a public interest immunity claim in respect of the minute, the government is doing no more than standing by well-established right to protect the public disclosure of cabinet deliberations in the same way as has been done by past successive governments, including by those opposite. 
In interlocutory hearings in the class action, the federal court upheld claims of public interest immunity in relation to cabinet materials, including, including this minute. Further, as recently as the 4th of August this year, the Freedom of Information Division of the AAT found that this document was properly the subject of a cabinet exemption under the Freedom of Information Act. So in closing, the letter from me setting out a detailed explanation about the basis of the public interest immunity claim was provided to the chair of the Community Affairs References Committee in August. These reasons continue to apply. Thank you, Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Reynolds. A Senator Senator Rice? Yes, yes. I wish to take note of the minister's answer. And I'm sad to see that the minister has chosen to avoid scrutiny, transparency and accountability and instead just sent another letter, which is not going to cut it. The committee did not make this further request for documents lightly either. And it is essential to get to the bottom of what went on with this appalling failed robo-debt scheme that caused such damage and such harm. It is essential that the Senate sees this information. Because, and the legal advice goes to the heart of what the government knew about robo-debt, how they, what they knew about its illegality, what they knew about the impact it was having on innocent Australians, this illegal robo-debt, which has now been acknowledged. I spoke yesterday as we gave the Community Affairs References Committee fifth interim report on the robo-debt debacle and, and the damage it has caused to so many innocent Australians. Yes, the fifth interim report. And we are pursuing this, and we are pursuing our claims and our desire to see this core information because it matters. It's important to remember why it matters. It matters be because it affects people's lives. I want to quote from a powerful piece in the ABC today where a Port Lincoln woman is calling for a royal commission into the government's unlawful robo-debt bungle in response to her brother's suicide after he repaid Centrelink payments while also experiencing financial hardship. Jessica Webb said their mother was contacted by Centrelink this year who, in the, trying to locate Mr Webb in order to repay the Centrelink payments he made in 2017, with the department not knowing Corey had died a few months after the repayments. Mum was confused and had to go through that process to explain he'd passed away, Ms Webb said. She said the Centrelink staff member explained that Corey had been given an illegal robo-debt and he can now be given compensation through a class action. So to Jessica Webb and to her family, I want to say how sorry we are to hear about your story. It's awful. It is unacceptable. It is wrong. And the government must be held accountable about this. This is why we are pursuing the government over the robo-debt bungle, because it matters. As Ms Webb said, I cannot highlight it enough. It is not about money. It does not matter how much money you give us. No amount of money is going to bring my brother back, she said. Compared to some of the other significant amounts, the robo-debt probably wasn't that much. But several thousand dollars when you have other debts is significant. The government must be held accountable. Robo-debt was appalling Liberal Party policy and it's damaged people across Australia. And that's why we are demanding answers. The Minister's answer is not acceptable. It's just continuing profound, callous, cruel indifference about the impact that robo-debt had on innocent Australians. I mean, the Greens, given that we are not able to get the information that the Senate deserves, that the Australian public deserves, the Greens feel that Clearly, the only way to get to the bottom of robo-debt is to have a royal commission. A royal commission seems it's going to be the only way that we're going to ensure a full and independent review of the robo-debt program and a forensic audit of the mess, because the government is refusing to cough up the information that we should be able to see here in the Senate. Clearly, a royal commission is going to be the only way to get to the bottom of how it happened and to make sure it doesn't happen again. This lack of transparency, lack of accountability must stop. 
It's yet again government hiding information about their failures, denying the harm that their programs have caused, denying reality, covering up, trying to deceive and mislead the public, covering up a legacy of disaster and lies. I mean, we've seen this covering up over and over again in this government's um, operations, this ducking and weaving, this unwilling to be upfront, honest, straight with the truth. We've seen it in sports rorts, we've seen it in the car park rorts, hiding information about their corrupt misuse of taxpayers' funds and refusing to hand over information that we deserve to see. This must stop. We need to get to the we will continue to try to get to the bottom of what went on with this robo debt debacle. But Critically, we need to kick this callous, uncaring, dishonest government out. We need a government that's going to support people, not a government that is just doing the business of billionaires and big corporations. We need a federal ICAC with teeth to get to the bottom of this deception. We need a government that cares for people that gives people the ability to live meaningful lives. We need a government that's willing to support people, not to be attacking them, and then, after they do, trying to cover it up and trying to pretend that the awful cruelty that happened, that led to people's deaths, was not their fault, because it was. And we need change. Thank you, Senator Rice. Uh, Senator Patrick? Not on the same issue. Oh, OK. I'll just see if there's no other speakers. Uh, Senator O'Neill. Yes, this there is. Point. Thank, thank you very you. much, uh, Senator. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. And I, I've seen the movie um, with with the repeat and the repeat and the repeat pattern in it. Groundhog Day, I think it's called. A and sadly, that's what it's starting to feel like here in this chamber with a government that is so profoundly committed to misleading the Australian people, to hiding the truth of their shameful behaviour, that they have the gall to show up here now for the fifth time and say it is not in the interest of the Australian people to know what it was that this government found out about the laws when they concocted robo-debt. It, it's, it's, it, it is amazing, Senator Wong. It's hard to believe that this minister could come in here heartlessly, cruelly and without any care, stand up and say to the Australian people, you don't deserve to know. It is not in your interest. It is not in the public interest to know how we stuffed this thing up so badly. Despite the fact that over a million people were served with illegal debts by this government, despite the fact that people suffered, unbelievably suffered, being hounded by their own government, by legal debt collectors, for debts that they didn't even own. And here we are, the fifth time that this government has the gall to stand up and say, you don't need to know. You don't need to know how we concocted this scheme. You don't need to know. It doesn't matter what the legal advice was. It doesn't matter if it was good or bad. You know, it's fine. We, we, we're through this now. Turn the page, move on. Well, there are people who aren't moving on. There are people whose lives were shattered by what this government did. Families that broke apart under the financial pressure of debts, $18,000, arriving at the door of a family that was doing the right thing, finding themselves with a letter of debt from this government, an illegal letter, an illegal debt found to be illegal, arrived into families and they just broke apart under financial pressure. And this minister, for the fifth time, is coming in here and saying, you don't have a right to know about our legal advice and how we constructed this dodgy scheme that has been found to be illegal. It is not, it is not an argument that makes any sense. It is not an argument that holds any ounce of integrity. But it is a reveal, a very powerful reveal, of a secretive, deceptive government 
that has got a mountain of mess behind it that's trying to cover it up and doesn't want us to pay attention. Well, I've made a promise to a few people about things that I'm not going to allow to be, to be left. This is one of them. And it involves personal conversations with people who this government can never repay. Never repay. And I'm speaking about two amazing women who spoke to me in the course of this inquiry by the name of Kath Madgwick and Jennifer Miller. Each of them in separate reports reported to the newspapers that their sons, Jared Madgwick, who only reached 22 years, and Rhys Cowzo, who reached the ripe age of 28 years, were so overcome by the pursuit of a false debt, an illegal debt, pushed on them by their government, that they could not see a way out of it. They could not see a way forward. And those two mothers grieved their sons. Because being a government impacts people's lives. This isn't a game. This isn't a debating society where we come in and we pretend. What we do here has real and powerful impact on the lives of people and sadly on the deaths of people. And this government shamefully constructed the robo-debt scheme. With his hands in the Treasury, Mr Morrison decided this was a great little scheme that he could cook up and he could get back money from the Australian people. Then he'd be able to go out and make an announcement, Mr Announcement, and say he saved this much money. And in doing so, he chased the Australian people down illegally. Now, this claim from the government that a public interest immunity should apply to this piece of information, the information that we requested, simply cannot be allowed to stand. And I, I alert all of those senators from the government who are in here and anyone who's listening that the Senate has made its wishes clear on four occasions, four occasions already that it says it rejects the government's PII claim. It says you do not have sufficient cause, sufi sufficient evidence and sufficient justification to avoid coming clean. I just want to read to you a little of what happened to these people in the evidence that we received from the Victorian Legal Aid, Ms McRae says, I acknowledge at the outset that I'm on the land of the Wiradjuri people and I, I, I put on the record this comment from Letitia. Robo-debt feels like a bullying system that affects people who are the most vulnerable. A lot of people don't know their rights or have the capacity to defend themselves when given an incorrect debt. I don't think it's right that Centrelink comes after people for debts without being sure that they owe money, especially when it's people who are in need of support who go to Centrelink in the first place. That's the voice of people who are caught up in this. We've got pages and pages of evidence. Teachers, a semi-retired teacher who took up a bit of casual work, never, ever had any problems with the law or with the government, never been on welfare hounded for his illegal debt that the government had to actually undo in the end for three years. People talk about the shame that they felt when this letter arrived because, because they should have a, a right to believe that their government would never do this to them. So while the government makes haste to move on, while the government continues to come in here and ignore the will of the Senate and refuse to reveal the documents upon which Mr Morrison concocted this scheme. They continue to insult every Australian to whom they should be apologising. If this government had any conscience at all, it would be stepping forward and saying, this is where we got it wrong. This was the legal advice we had. This is what went wrong and it doesn't match with what we found out. This must never happen again. But that's not what you're going to hear from a government that feels it's entitled to rule no matter how badly it does the job. And you can't get much worse than raising an illegal a debt against your own people and driving people over the edge. 
Robo-debt isn't a thing to forget. Robo-debt is a thing to remember. And the advice that the government received, or if it's, if it's perhaps even worse than that, if there, if there is no advice, if they didn't receive proper advice, that needs to become known so that the mistake that was made by this government is never, ever made again. We've had this level of refusal to respond to questions at every stage of our inquiry. In hearings, we've asked for facts, we've asked for evidence, we've asked for information, and once the government initiated its first public interest immunity claim, it's just continued to roll out the same claim over and over again. Here, here amongst my papers, I actually have the latest letter that's just come, come in from the minister. And, you know, it's not dated. It's not dated because they just photocopy the same letter every time they come forward. It's contemptuous. It's a contemptuous response to a genuine request from the Senate on not one occasion now, but five. The minister's public interest immunity claim, and sadly we're getting a few of these from people, this one is one of the worst ones that I've ever seen. It smacks of self-indulgence and a refusal to take this claim of the Senate to get to the bottom of this matter seriously. And I can say I will not allow this to rest because too many Australians got done over by Mr Morrison and his scam plan and we will not allow that to go uncritiqued and misunderstood. We need to know what went wrong Thank and we will Senator pursue this. Senator your time has expired. Um, on the same matter, Senator Walsh? Uh, it is the same matter. Thank yep. you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise to take note of Minister Reynolds' uh, statement as well. Uh, and this government is at it again, uh, refusing to be transparent, refusing to own up to its own decisions, um, avoiding requests of this chamber as the minister leaves the chamber now, uh, and avoiding accountability, accountability for their illegal robo-debt scheme, a scheme that caused hurt and despair, a scheme that caused so much misery that some people tragically took their own lives. I remember the story of Miranda from Melbourne, who was in hospital receiving treatment for advanced spinal cancer when she received a $4,000 robo-debt. She was unemployed and applying for disability allowance, but Centrelink still took $40 a week from her payments when she was literally on her back in hospital. I also remember Nathan's story. He was served with two robo-debts, totalling more than $6,000. He had to move back home and work 50 hours a week to pay it back. Uh, and I remember his words, and his words are relevant to this discussion today, because he said, and I quote, I wanted to know why those ministers felt that it was appropriate to use this illegal system and to target the most vulnerable people. He wanted to ask this government, and I quote, why did you think it was okay? Why did you think it was okay to take money from the poorest people without giving them the chance to argue their case. And years later, here we are, we are still asking the same question. Why did this government think it was okay? That is what the Senate is asking this minister today. And Australians and all of the victims of robo-debt, they deserve an answer. They deserve a real answer from this government. It is completely unbelievable that this question is still being asked, that this robo-debt scheme, this tragic scheme, is still being covered up by this government and that we still can't get the answers that people deserve. Because despite the record of destruction uh, and despair caused by this government's scheme, Still today, no one has been held accountable. Right. No one. Especially not the Prime Minister, who, of course, as we all know, is the original architect of the robo-debt scheme, a scheme that hounded and harassed 
some of our most vulnerable Australians. This is the same Prime Minister who turned a blind eye to Australia's largest companies getting billions of dollars in JobKeeper despite making rising profits. $20 billion to companies that had rising profits during a global pandemic. Did Prime Minister Morrison or this government hound and harass them to pay back the money? Did they force these companies to deal with the same stress and the same anxiety that they forced on those people, those vulnerable victims of the robo-debt scheme? Of course they didn't. Of course they didn't because this government has a blatant double standard, a blatant double standard. They aren't on the side of everyday Australians. They aren't on the side of vulnerable Australians. They are on the side of keeping their own jobs, not looking after the lives and livelihoods of vulnerable Australians. And despite being the architect of this scheme, the Prime Minister is now saying today that the role of government is apparently to get out of people's lives. Well, it's a bit too late for the victims of the illegal robo-debt scheme. Get out, of our, uh, get, get out of people's lives, he reckons. Um, can you believe it? It is hard to believe the Prime Minister when he says this after hounding and harassing people with this illegal scheme. The architect of robo-debt wants to see government out of people's lives. Uh, unless, of course, you're poor, because this government is not on the side of everyday Australians. They are only on their own side, the side that avoids transparency, the side that avoids accountability, the side that avoids delivering answers to this chamber properly requested. Australians cannot trust this Prime Minister or this government. They can't, tell them to, to, they can't trust them to tell the truth. Uh, they can't trust them to take responsibility and they can't trust this government to be on their side. Yeah. I'm going to go to uh, Senator Green on the same matter, I believe. Senator Green. Oh, thank you, um, Deputy President. Um, I rise uh, to speak on this very important PII claim and the Minister's uh, rejection um, of the request by the Senate Community Affairs Committee to table documents about robo-debt, about the scheme that harassed uh, everyday Australians for debts that they did not owe. And I want to speak briefly about these PII claims um, and about how they're being used to shield, to shield this minister, but also other members of the government from accountability, from scrutiny, from transparency, and from telling the truth to people in the Australian public. What we know about robo-debt is very dark indeed, a very dark stain on government accountability and transparency. But we know that Scott Morrison, Scott Morrison has been out there, the Prime Minister over the last couple of weeks and last couple of days, talking uh, focus group lines about the government needing to get out of people's lives. And every time I heard the Prime Minister say that line, that, that focus group line this, this week, that the government needs to get out of people's lives, well, it brought us all the way back to robo-debt, didn't it? Because we know that Scott Morrison was the social services minister, the architect of this scheme. We know that he was the treasurer who was planning on banking the savings from this scheme. We know that as prime minister, he has uh, instructed ministers to continue to hide the details that would give so much understanding and accountability for this scheme to the Australian public. And yet at every step of the way, as social services minister, as treasurer, now as prime minister, he evades the truth when it comes to the robo-debt scheme. The robo-debt scheme was a scheme where everyday Australians were sent debts that they did not owe, a letter demanding payment for a debt that they did not owe. And we've heard harrowing stories, as my colleagues uh, in the Senate today have detailed, uh, of the effects of receiving a letter like that. And I can only speak from my own experience, uh, being uh, living in North Queensland, in the aftermath of the Townsville floods, hearing that people living in Townsville after the floods 
that had destroyed the city had received these robo debt letters. It is a stain on our democracy that this happened uh, at a time when the government knew that this scheme was illegal. And that is why we are asking for these documents today. Uh, it is because we need to understand. We need to understand what the government knew and we need to understand what they in advice and information they were given uh, and how they took that advice uh, into their considerations when deciding to continue the scheme. This government has a legacy, a legacy when it comes to the most vulnerable Australians of leaving them on their own, but it gets even worse. The legacy has now become of taking active steps to grind vulnerable Australians into the ground. That's exactly what this scheme did. It's exactly what the cashless debit card is doing right now. Uh, it is exactly what this government uh, will continue to do unless we know the truth about this scheme. So the PII claims, as the government has, uh, has claimed, do seek information about legal advice. But can I be clear, some of the information that the committee is seeking uh, from Services Australia uh, doesn't relate to the actual uh, contents of that advice. The government is refusing, the minister today is refusing again, to provide information that relates to when the advice was sought. Uh, we can't even get a date from this minister. Um, we don't know um, uh, who provided that advice. Um, and we're not able to understand um, the nature of that advice, uh, but also um, how that advice was taken into consideration by the executive at the time. Um, these are questions that do need to be answered. Uh, and, and there is a question about whether the Senate um, is continually being ignored by this government. Um, the Senate has made a decision that these, this information needs to be public. The Senate has decided that this information is crucial for the public to understand, and the Senate has decided that the Minister has continued to not make out a public interest claim, to not sufficiently explain the harm to the public of having this information released, to not sufficiently explain how general information about when advice was sought, a date, nothing more than a date, how that information would harm the public. That is what the Senate has decided. And again, today we've had the minister refusing, refusing to deliver documents and information as requested by the Senate. It just goes to show that this is a government that will do anything to avoid accountability, to avoid transparency. And what we know is that when you have a situation where the government has done something so awful to its own people, so awful that it has uh, it has uh, meant that people have taken um, uh, have been affected mentally, affected physically. Um, stories of people taking their own lives because of this action. Then the response to something so extreme and so damaging needs to be utmost transparency. The degree to which this action was taken and the effect that it had means that every effort the government makes in dealing with the aftermath of this situation should be to open up the books and let us see what they knew and when they knew it. The effects of this, uh, of, of this scheme uh, and the extreme nature, the extreme nature of the impacts of the robo-debt scheme should in itself tell the minister, tell the prime minister that this is something that they need to fess up to, that they need to make sure that every single piece of information is on the public record now, that they make that information available to people. And that's exactly why the Senate has continually rejected these PII claims. I just want to bring us back to what the government, the minister, the prime minister has been saying the last couple of weeks. He's been saying that the government should get out of people's lives. When he says that, what he really means is that uh, the government, uh, that we should not be asking this government questions. 
about accountability and transparency, that there shouldn't be a two way street, that when the government asks you to pay a debt that you didn't owe, that you don't have the same right to ask the government for all the information that they knew when they asked you that debt. That this government uh, is a government that has placed people on a cashless debit card, uh, uh, telling those people how to spend their own money. That this is a government who continually tries to tell people what to do with their own lives. And yet, when it comes to what the government is prepared to do, they will not listen to the public. They will not listen to people who have been hurt and harmed by this scheme. And today, what they are refusing to do is to listen to the Senate once again. Well, I think that they should have more respect for the Senate, for the Australian people, and for the victims of this scheme. Because if they had respect for the victims, the minister would be marching in here right now and tabling those documents, tabling every piece of information available publicly so that we understand finally and completely what was when, what they knew and when they knew it. And the reason, the reason that she is refusing to do that today is because Scott Morrison was the architect of this scheme. And we know that if we have those documents tabled, we will find out that he was up to his eyeballs in this, up to his eyeballs in a scheme that destroyed people's lives. Thank you, Deputy President. Thank you, uh, Senator Green. And I do remind you uh, to refer to uh, those in the other place by their correct title. Is it on this matter, Senator Kitching? I haven't forgotten you, Senator Patrick. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Deputy President. Um, I'll go to, I mean, really, this is such a cynical exercise. When one looks at the advice, when one looks at the PII claim, um, you can see that, I mean, really, this is just a letter that's just done the rounds for, in fact, for years. So it doesn't just rest with this minister who's uh, concerned for people on robo-debt, concerned for people on the NDIS, are about as sincere as the crocodile tears we have witnessed her cry in this chamber. Um, going to the legal advice, I mean, one might think that the, they could have actually mentioned in this, this letter from Senator Reynolds that they're actually a model litigant. Now, these will be words that are really quite unfamiliar to Senator Reynolds because she wouldn't know what a model of anything is, but they are a model litigant. And as a model litigant, you can't just give a blanket statement in relation to the concerns that the Senate has raised. This is, remember, this is taxpayers' money. So we all pay, everyone out there pays, people who are requiring assistance in some cases pay, this is taxpayers' money, and she's got the temerity to say in this letter that, oh, we can't possibly release anything, anything at all, without actually looking at the requests that the Senate has made. So she's just given a blanket statement, a blanket denial. Remember, the government, when this, was us, when this letter was written, the government is no longer facing legal action. There is no longer any court action. So in relation to the legal advice being sought and the date, the lead, that would say that she can actually give some of that. So she could actually have a proper look at the, requ the request from the Senate. She could actually do that. I know that it might strain her, I was going to say two brain cells, but I'll say 1.5. And she could actually look at it and distinguish those which can be answered very easily, so including the date. But that is, again, the date when the advice was sought is, of course, another cynical exercise. And the reason it is cynical is because the request for the date would, might actually reveal that the government received direct legal advice, that they, that they knew the scheme was rotten. Now, when I look at the, lately the secretary, Ms Campbell, when she was a secretary in the relevant department, she's now gone to foreign affairs, but... When she was there, she said, we've talked about the fact that it was legally insufficient. So remember, <laughs> I mean, legally insufficient is a bit mealy-mouthed, but that's so much better than the minister. And in our system, it's the minister that is responsible for the very good reason that if the public does not agree with the government, they can vote them out. That is the reason why she is responsible. She should start to act like it. So Ms Campbell says, 
We've talked about the fact that it was legally insufficient. We have apologised for the hurt to the people on whom the debt was raised. I too apologise to staff because staff were, was, very, was very upset because you can imagine if you're taking phone calls and I'll read out one of these instances. The robo-debt has had a huge impact on fellow co-workers and myself. To read the stories of suicide and customers' distress in the news made a lot of us feel sick. I have had nights where I could not sleep thinking about conversations I have had with customers regarding their robo-debts. Some have talked about suicide on the call. To hear a grown man crying on the phone whose wife had died recently and he is the carer for his young children is heartbreaking. Now what a terrible, terrible instance this is that this scheme made not only the people who were being victimised by it because they were receiving false robo-debt notices. Imagine having that and knowing what, your, what the staff are going through and still continuing with it. Not actually thinking that maybe there's something wrong in the state of Denmark. But of course, no, because we've got this minister. So Ms Campbell said, We've talked about the fact that it is, was legally insufficient. I hope Minister Reynolds is actually listening to this through you, Deputy President, because she might learn something, that her own department can be more generous about this than she would ever dream of being. We have apologised for the hurt to the people on whom the debt was raised. I too apologise to staff, but I would note that this has been going for some time. For the staff to say, as they describe it in this letter, that robo-debt was something new, unfortunately, is just not true. Staff in the agency have to deal with very difficult circumstances, etc. Now, the other question, of course, is, and the reason why when the date for the legal advice was sought, is because, of course, it might show not that the government received advice and knew that, that, knew that the scheme was rotten, but in fact it also raises the possibility that the government sought no advice at all. So it would be interesting to know. So funnily enough, the Senate has asked the minister who is responsible for providing answers, but she's just given this blanket statement of, you know, no, you're not getting anything. But it's taxpayers' money, and taxpayers have a right to know that their money is being spent appropriately. Now, let's go to someone who might know something about the law as opposed to the minister. Under questioning, the Gordon legal partner, Andrew Gretsch, told a Senate inquiry on Thursday that there was no reason the government couldn't answer the committee's questions. I'm reading from a media report in The Guardian from Luke Henriquez Gomez. So, the class action settlement has been approved by the court and Gordon Legal is now working to identify and process interest payments to victims. It would be impossible to see how the Commonwealth could legitimately sustain a claim, Mr Gretsch said, while as technically those proceedings are still on foot, it's not as if the parties can go back to court and relitigate the issues. So instead of the minister paying attention to what a Senate inquiry and the evidence before it, she's just issued this blanket letter saying she's not going to answer anything. It's absolute contempt. But really, I mean, what else do we expect from this minister? She is just, it is just ridiculous that she's in that cabinet. She's a terrible person. Now, um, Senator Kitching, I would ask you to... I'll withdraw that she's Thank a terrible you. person, yes. Uh, Senator I'll Kitching, withdraw, I'll withdraw. Just withdraw now, can I just go comment. to... I'll, I've withdrawn. Um, now, the second ground that she's claiming, the disclosure of the deliberations of Cabinet, I think it's a pretty distant claim that she's making here. So she says she can't do it because there might be a claim in relation to any request. So. It would be actually really useful if the minister could have a look at ministerial duty in our, in our system, in our system of democracy. It would be actually useful if she could go and look at that. Maybe, I don't want to sort of overburden her, but she might like to have a look at the constitution and read a few constitutional law cases. I, I say again, I don't want to overburden her because that would be far, far too much for her. But she should go and look at that and understand that in fact there is a, a duty of transparency and disclosure to the people who are voting 
for the government. It is an absolute basic fact in our democracy, yet it seems that that minister is unable to actually understand or pay any respect to that. So really, she should have another look at the, quest at the questions that are being asked. She should take her letter and actually read it probably properly, because she has, probably hasn't done that. Someone else has probably written it for her. And she should actually understand that she has a duty. But, you know, I'm not going to hold my, de my breath, Deputy President. Well, thank you, yeah. Senator Kitching. Uh, Senator Dunning. Madam Deputy President, look, I accept uh, very much this is a um, very sensitive issue, having served on the Community Affairs Committee uh, that examined one of the iterations of the issue we're discussing here. I just would ask you, Madam Deputy President, to ask those who've made contributions to this debate uh, to perhaps draw a line between a minister's professional conduct and personal reflections, be it mental capacity or otherwise, perhaps to uh, temper their remarks and uh, where they've gone beyond what is reasonably expected of a senator in this place, perhaps to withdraw such as comments around brain cells, etc. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Dunning. I'm Senator Kitching. Uh, you know, I'm, given that Senator Dunningham is so reasonable, you know, I'll withdraw the comments about mental capacity. But the reason that I am so upset about this is remember yes. there are people who have killed themselves, Senator killed Kitching. themselves, Senator as Kitching, Corey Webb did. When you withdraw, you, you, you simply withdraw that, um, that, um, th that comment has been made. So if you could just withdraw and not make any comment, I would appreciate that. Thank you. I'll withdraw. Thank you. I don't think there are any other speakers on this matter, so I'm going to put the question that um, Senator Rice take note. So those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Deputy President. I rise uh, to seek an explanation pursuant to uh, uh, Standing Order 745A as to, um, and I know uh, the representing minister is, is, isn't in here, but um, the duty minister was briefed. So I asked the minister representing the minister, representing the prime minister, as to why question number 4291 relating to AUKUS announcements and submarines has not been answered. Uh, minister. Uh, thank you, Deputy, Madam Deputy President. Uh, look, j just on that, um, yes, uh, obviously the uh, Senator Birmingham isn't here. Uh, and uh, he has asked me to acknowledge the inquiry that Senator Patrick's making now um, into the status of those questions that were placed on notice just over a month ago into the sensitive matters around the AUKUS strategic partnership. Uh, and Senator Birmingham has asked, uh, Birmingham has, um, asked me to advise that uh, we'll, he will inquire into the status of those answers and we'll get back to you ASAP on that. Senator Patrick. I rise to take note of the minister's answer. Now, I'll just uh, go to this question. It is about AUKUS, and so it is important, uh, and it's important in relation to issues of national security, uh, in relation to issues relating to South Australia, um, and also uh, some issues that uh, have been very, very public. In fact, I, I look at the question and I, um, uh, I see uh, a question like, on what date did the Prime Minister discuss or otherwise communicate about the attack, the attack class submarine project with the French president? On what date did the Prime Minister tell the French president that Australia was pulling the plug? Now, I looked at the clerks. I'm not sure that the French president can answer a question on notice uh, through the media. Um, I think that's a no. So, you know, this question remains outstanding. The, the, this, this is an important question. It goes to... Uh, uh, a very important national program that we have about um, submarines. I get a lot of people ask me, why submarines? Why are they so important? Well, let me tell you, back in the uh, Falklands War, uh, at the outset of the war, the British media reported, uh, as the Argentinians invaded the Falklands, that they in fact had a nuclear-powered submarine down off South America in the waters around, uh, around the Falkland Islands. Now, it turned out that wasn't true. It was false. Uh, but that's the nature of submarines. You can, if you want to, create the perception that they're somewhere where they're not. They are very important or very potent uh, tools. Asymmetric is the word that's often used when we talk about submarines. 
They have a whole range of things that they can do in, in wartime uh, that allow, uh, that, well, that other assets can't do as easily. You know, they can lay mines covertly. They can uh, insert special forces. They can conduct uh, uh, reconnaissance. They can fire off uh, missiles. They can uh, uh, sink uh, warships. So they can do a lot of things. Uh, now, of course, we never want that to happen, and it's very important that we have a strong um, uh, defence capability, a strong submarine capability, such that uh, no one ever looks at Australia and says, we're going to take them on because the cost would be too high. Now, in order to be able to do that, you have to have a standing submarine force that is highly capable and that people understand to be highly capable. Uh, one, the things that our Defence Force during, or our Navy does during peacetime is to make sure those submarines are, uh, are practised or the submarine crews are practised in what it is they do, so they train, they develop tactics. And in the case of our submarines, they also do intelligence operations as well. So they can go into areas and they can monitor exactly what is going on. Uh, and uh, that's a capability that uh, uh, not many other assets can do. You can, you can uh, fly a satellite over a, uh, an area of a country, you can fly an aircraft over an area of a country, but persistence and stealth working together are extremely powerful. I, I say to the chamber, if you ever listen to a, ra a police radio scanner for a couple of hours, you'll find out that uh, there might be a, uh, uh, a break and enter taking place th three kilometres down the road, or there could be uh, a breathalyser being set up down the road, or there could be uh, some sort of domestic violence incident taking place if you listen to a scanner for a short period of time. But if you listen for two or three weeks, you can work out uh, the shifts, how many officers are on duty on a Friday night versus how many are on duty on a Wednesday night and what time they change over. And after listening to a few police chases, you'll work out exactly what the criteria is for calling off a, uh, a police chase, what the rules of engagement are. And that's what submarines can do in the context of going into areas and looking and seeing exactly what's going on in peacetime uh, such that you are well prepared in the um, event that you are uh, uh, end up in a conflict of some sort. They are very important. Now, uh, we had a submarine program in place. It was the attack class submarine. And uh, I was one of the first people that raised significant concerns about it. I am of the view that the Prime Minister made the correct call when he cancelled the program. That program was uh, a very expensive program. It was running over schedule. Uh, it wasn't meeting expectation in terms of industry um, involvement and it wasn't, in my view, likely to deliver a regionally superior submarine. So I congratulate the Coalition for cancelling the program. I don't congratulate it, them in the manner in which they did that. Uh, we saw, I think it was on the 16th of September, I hope I've got that date right, but we saw the Prime Minister stand up and make an announcement uh, really a big distracting announcement uh, utilising the US President and the uh, UK Prime Minister whilst he shut down a $2.4 billion program that uh, actually had started under this Liberal government and had concluded under this Liberal government. There was no necessity, none whatsoever, to make an announcement about uh, AUKUS on the same day that they cancelled the, uh, the attack class program. What should have been done is that the French should have been brought in, the French should have been told exactly what was happening uh, in relation to the uh, uh, future submarine program. Uh, all of the diplomacy necessary to deal with that particular issue should have taken place. The announcement could have been made to the Australian public that we were no longer continuing with, the, continuing with that program. And then a couple of weeks later, we could have announced the AUKUS arrangements, because you know, the reality is uh, we actually don't know what AUKUS, is, uh, you know, what AUKUS is really about. There's a study that's going on for the next 18 months to work that out. There is no reason why those announcements had to be made together and that that was a failing of the government. And my question, the question that hasn't been answered, about communication between the, 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 the Australian Prime Minister and the French Prime Minister, the French President, 
uh, is relevant to examining what happened in those instances and it should be responded to in a timely fashion. So, uh, you know, I have a genuine interest in understanding the answers to these questions and it is inappropriate that the, the Prime Minister has not answered this in, in the required time frame. This is the third day in a row in which I've had to rise and seek an explanation as to why the Prime Minister is not answering questions directed at him um, that come from my constituents who are entitled to know who the Prime Minister works for, who pay the Prime Minister's salary. It's a, it's a, a matter of respect for questions that are asked by senators on behalf of their constituents to be answered in a timely fashion. And I just would remind uh, the duty minister to perhaps pass that on to uh, Senator uh, Birmingham. The, you know, the, the, the announcement that was made is, is problematic in, in many different ways. If I go back to 2009, it was a Labor government then, uh, the 2009 White Paper uh, announced that we were going to double our submarine force. It was going to go from 6 to 12 and it was going to do that within three decades. So uh, from 2009 we would expect that by 2039 we would have 12 new regionally superior submarines. That was the aim. Now, uh, the, uh, what, we've, what we now see with the, with the plan on record is something quite different. If we just go with what has been announced to date, remembering that uh, we have uh, the, the, the announcement saying we're going to do an 18-month study and in 2020, uh, 2040 we're going to get a future uh, nuclear-powered submarine, that means in 2039 when we are required to have, or we were supposed to have 12 regionally superior submarines, we're going to have five, only five, very aged Collins class submarines. Now that just seems absolutely crazy in the context of uh, the very reason for going to AUKUS, which was the rising tension. Now in 2009, we, we, we uh, yeah, the, the, the um, must have been the, the Rudd government uh, uh, announced the, the 12 submarines and they did so on the basis of concerns about where things were going geostrategically and it looks like Defence got that right. They've actually upped the ante but they've basically left us strategically vulnerable. The Liberal Party would claim that they are strong on national security but you're not. You've gone from 12 submarines as the aim, 12 uh, regionally superior submarines by 2039, to five aged Collins class submarines. And that's not a criticism of the, of the Collins class submarines at all. The, the, uh, the, the men and women down at Osborne do a fantastic job of maintaining those submarines. And I, I'm not suggesting they wouldn't be safe, because that's what our uh, people do down in Adelaide. They make sure those submarines are uh, 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 in tip-top shape before they let them leave uh, Osborne as part of their uh, full cycle docking program. But that's a very different thing to, to a submarine uh, that is uh, aged and asked to go into combat. You know, taking a, 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 an arrow into a battle with uh, rifles. And that's the sort of problem that's created. No matter how much you try to uh, improve the Collins class submarines, uh, the, the, some of these new regionally, uh, uh, brand new regional submarines are very, very highly uh, capable submarines. And I know because I've been on some of, the, some of them. I've been to sea on the South Korean uh, Type 214 submarines on a number of occasions. Well, uh, well trained crews very highly capable submarines and uh, you know, I've worked with a number of different navies around this region. So sadly we've ended up with a situation where uh, the Liberal government who claim to be strong on national security have less, left us in a very vulnerable, vulnerable position.
And the other thing that's happened in terms of this announcement is we've got a whole bunch of people down in Adelaide and actually around the country that had committed to the attack class program. And again, I support the, I support the closing down of that program, but the manner in which it, was, it, it uh, closed down has had an, a harmful effect on workers down in Adelaide and around the country and companies. One of the companies I've visited recently, and I won't name them because defence can be quite uh, uh, vindictive uh, uh, in, in relation to bad stories coming on from industry, uh, the company that I went and visited, they had two to three years' worth of work booked ahead on the attack class submarine. And that work's no longer there. Now, the way companies work, for those that haven't ever had to be a business development manager or a director of a company, you have to work and make sure you've got an order book that runs out uh, a couple of years to make sure you can plan with your workforce uh, to uh, be able to achieve the objectives of the company. When someone rips out a major contract, uh, uh, you, you know, that, that, those, that, that company would not have been pursuing work because they would have known that their work load was set for the next couple of years, they didn't have capacity to do any more, so they would have sort of been uh, resting in terms of trying to develop further business. Suddenly that work is stripped out from underneath them and it leaves a company that might have 150 people going, what do we do now? And there has been some uh, uh, attempts by the government to deal with individual workers but not with the companies. In my view, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the response to companies has been very shallow and harmful. These are good companies. Some of these companies have actually invested. They've invested to get to the point of being able to tender for a contract to meet the requirements of uh, a naval group and they've got to a point where they're basically ready to go and the, the, the contract has been cancelled. All of that investment is lost. And that is an investment that sometimes comes from the, from the wallets of mum and dad company owners. And uh, uh, again, I don't mind the fact that we've cancelled this contract. It's about how we went about it and what we are or are not doing in respect of, uh, the, um, uh, in respect of uh, those companies that have been caught up in this, uh, in this whole thing. So you know, I'm going to be continuing to answer, ask questions on behalf of my constituents and I don't think it's unreasonable for me to expect that those questions get answered in, in a timely fashion. I'm not asking for anything that's classified. I'm not asking for anything that's overly sensitive. I know, I know the Prime Minister might be sensitive about questions about the French President, but they, the, the questions ought to be answered on time and it is uh, uh, disrespectful that the Prime Minister hasn't answered them. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Senator Mario Smith. Thank you, Deputy President. I also rise to take note of the Minister's response. And on this occasion, I do agree with Senator Patrick. It is not unreasonable to get an answer to these questions. It is not unreasonable to get a timely answer to these questions. But it's also entirely unsurprising that we don't have an answer to Senator Patrick's questions. Because when it comes to this announcement, when it comes to the impact of this announcement on my state, there are many questions which remain unanswered by this government. Questions which go to the heart of the future economic prosperity of my state. Questions about local jobs, questions about local contact, content in the new contracts. These are significant questions, and by failing to answer them, by failing to have an open conversation with the people of South Australia, this government is creating anxiety, deep anxiety, deep anxiety with the people working on these contracts, deep anxiety for people who have changed their whole lives to work on these projects, either in South Australia or indeed abroad, and I've had families contact me from abroad who have found this incredibly stressful. We still don't know what will be built in South Australia. We don't know when. We don't know precisely how local companies, how local content will be engaged. We don't know what the future looks like 
And whilst we, we support the AUKUS decision, we're provided bipartisanship on that, as we should, there are significant questions which remain unanswered, and they need to be answered as a matter of urgency. South Australians are anxious about this, and it's no wonder they're anxious, because time and time again, when it comes to submarines in our state, when it comes to defence expenditure in our state, when it comes to local content requirements in our state, they've been misled by this government. They've been led down one path, fed something, then fed something else, promised one thing, had it ripped away from them, promised something else, stepped back from that. And now we've got more than 1,100 jobs on the line that we know about. That's not including the people working for small businesses, the people working for businesses gearing up to tender for this work, the businesses who have spent money but not yet have a contract in their hand. And Senator Patrick's right, it takes time. It takes time, particularly for these small businesses. Not every company is a large company. Not every company can withstand this kind of uncertainty. And the workers are stressed. They are stressed and they're nervous and they don't trust this government. They don't trust this government to be honest with them. They don't trust this government to act with urgency. And so when Senator Patrick stands here and asks for an answer for these questions, I'm happy to stand here and support him because my state needs answers. These workers need answers. We've used estimates to do that. We're using the committee system to do that. It's reasonable that on the floor of this parliament, all that information that we requested, that we need to know urgently, so that we can provide some comfort and assurance to the people in my state who are anxious. And let me be clear, it's not just the people working on this program directly. It's not just those who are directly employed by Naval Group, although of course it is most critical for them. But let's be clear, when there is uncertainty for this industry in my state, it affects our entire state. It affects business confidence in our state, which has a significant impact and a flow-on effect on the rest of the economy, on other people's jobs, on the decisions South Australians are making for themselves and their future and their families. South Australians already stressed around issues of brain drain. South Australians who don't want their kids to go into state for work, who want a bright future for them in our state. High-skilled jobs, secure jobs technical jobs, jobs which will give them a long-term future in South Australia. But they need answers, they need clarity. We need to know that this government is absolutely committed to maximising South Australian input and involvement in this. We need answers on that. The South Australian workforce working on these projects needs answers on that. They need that security, they need that assurance, and so does every single small business owner and employee who depends on this work in South Australia. So whilst we support the decision, we don't support the lack of clarity, right? We want assurances. We want assurances for South Australian workers. I want assurances for my state. I want to know about the future of secure and high-skilled work in my state when it comes to these defence projects. Thank you, uh, Senator Marielle Smith. And so the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Griff. Senator Patrick, to take note, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I will now move to taking note. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Kitching. Thank you, Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answer given by Senator Birmingham to the question asked by Senator Wong. It was a question in relation to why government senators voted against a motion calling on political leaders to condemn, without qualification, recent examples of violent extremism directed at health, care work health workers and other groups. Unlike too many senators opposite, Labor does not engage in fantasy politics. We're not trying to nod and wink to those who see a deep state conspiracy behind every public health measure. We're not playing footsie under the table with peddlers of quack remedies and vicious lies. While all Victorians, and I did too, struggled with lockdown, despaired at the lack of connection and worried deeply about the impact of what needed to be done, not many, not many felt the need to attack and urinate on the shrine of remembrance. 
And fortunately, not many Liberal senators felt the need to adopt the unthinking, dangerous formulation that Senator Henderson chose to. In September this year, in my home city of Melbourne, just metres away from the COVID wards of the Royal Melbourne Hospital, we saw an ugly, thuggish mob having just stripped the bunning shelves bare of high vis in an attempt to cosplay as construction workers, set itself upon the West Melbourne headquarters of the CFMEU. Union officials were punched and kicked, attacked with makeshift weapons. A dog was brutally kicked, and I thank the RSPCA for identifying and charging the putrid individual responsible. The union secretary had full beer bottles thrown at his head by some in the mob. Make no mistake, Dep Deputy President, a full beer bottle thrown at a person's head is a prospectively legal weapon. It is a miracle no one was killed. But this is the context in which Senator Henderson felt it appropriate to tweet, and I quote, I condemn these violent protests, but I understand why so many workers are turning against the Dan Andrews government. I condemn these violent protests, but... If violent protesters had thrown full beer bottles at her office and the people working in her office, I would have condemned this as an act of terrorism. I would have demanded that those involved be brought to justice. I would not have indulged in social worker type excuse manufacturing, exploring the origin of their rage. Terrorism is terrorism, Deputy President. And I refer to the ASIO Act and its definition of terrorism. Acts or threats of violence that are likely to achieve a political objective, either in Australia or overseas. Acts of threats of violence intended to influence the policy of a government, either in Australia or overseas. Terrorist acts and related offences are further defined in the Commonwealth Criminal Code Act 1995. Senator Henderson demanded I apologise for calling out her shameful, I condemn violence, but tweet. Not in one tweet in response, but in about 20 but that is Senator Henderson for us. Well, I will never apologise to an apologist for those who quite literally urinate on the memory of our fallen soldiers. Protest is a vital part of democracy. And when it is respectful and peaceful and passionate, it can be a powerful force for moving public debate. But you would never catch me making excuses for violent protesters or rioters not for the Black Lives Matters protesters who set fire to a police union office in Philadelphia, not for unironically violent protests that sometimes gather to oppose Australian military interventions regardless of mission, not for any unionist in any situation. Every party represented in this chamber that helps make the laws that shape our nation must fundamentally respect the rule of law and the laws themselves. In a democracy, there is no need and there is no excuse excusing those who indulge in violence to advance their cause or to oppose another. Mr. Pre Mr Deputy President, I will finish by saying that Labor and I will never sit back and say nothing in the face of violence and intimidation in our cities and in our communities. We will not, like some of those opposite, walk on the edge of a razor and talk out of both sides of our mouths in an attempt to pry off a few votes while our nurses and healthcare workers, the literal heroes of this pandemic, cannot walk proud, cannot hold their heads high through their own streets without fearing that they will be attacked by those so far down the rabbit hole that I fear they are beyond redemption. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Kitching. Senator Abetz. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Look, the government uh, very clearly, and everybody on this side, clearly condemns those that seek to incite violence or engage in violence. And to try to suggest otherwise is absolutely unbecoming. I believe that Senator Kitching is in fact better than that which she has portrayed herself this afternoon. Unfortunately, we have now seen her personally attack Senator um, Reynolds in quite a spiteful way referring to brain cells and uh, other Senator, things. Senator Abetz, please resume your seat. That was dealt with at the time. Those remarks were withdrawn. It is absolutely inappropriate for you to repeat them, and I would ask that you withdraw that. I withdraw that which is on the Hansard. Um, 
Senator Kitching has engaged in personal denigration of other female senators in this place. Not one of them, but two of them. And of course, she's also engaged in denigrating the registered organisation, commission officials, and the list goes on. And so, Madam Deputy President, what this contribution by Senator Kitching has been all about, unfortunately, is to seek to attack and try to make a point out of something which does nothing for the cohesion of Australian society. I am sure that every single senator in this place condemns those that would seek to incite violence or actually engage in violence. There is no difference between us over the aisle or across the political divide in this country, and that is why we are such a good cohesive society. And for those that seek to inflame the situation by referring to some who engage in conduct unbecoming, do the cohesion of our nation no benefit. This time of taking note of answers is an opportunity, especially for the opposition, to put forward to the Australian people what their vision for Australia is all about, what their plan is, what their policies are. But instead, how do they use the time to attack individuals? And that is what happens when you've got a hapless, sad, forlorn opposition, devoid of policies, devoid of a plan, devoid of a vision. What do you do? You talk about individuals, you seek to denigrate the individuals, you seek to point to some social media comment and uh, blow that into something of a great note. The simple fact is we on this side, Madam Deputy President, are committed and devoted to ensuring that Australia emerges from COVID-19 with a good, sound, strong economic recovery, as it is being overseen by our Federal Treasurer. We are concentrating on jobs, job security, job development. We're looking at national resilience to ensure that Australia can withstand the withhold of supplies be it in fuel, in medical supplies and elsewhere. National resilience, a fundamental issue that you would have thought those opposite who lust after the government benches might actually have a reason and rationale for that desire. But no, it is just for the sake of power and they think that they can achieve that by tearing down members of the government. The Australian people see through that. They want more substance. They don't just want the personal attacks. So we as a government continue in ensuring our defence capability, our environmental stewardship. All these matters are front and centre of our considerations. And whilst the ALP continues to use question time to personally denigrate the Prime Minister and anybody else that they think they can have a cheap shot at, we get on with the business of government, economic development, security, keeping our country safe from COVID and from external threats, ensuring that we have good environmental stewardship. They're the things that the people of Australia elect us to do. That is what the Australian people want us to concentrate on and not engage in the sort of personal attacks, partisan uh, politics, which are, quite frankly isn't even appropriate for undergraduate student politics. And so I invite the ALP to reconsider their approach to uh, public policy debate Thank you, Senator in this Rebecca, chamber. Your time has expired. Senator Ciccone. Thank you very much, Deputy President. Uh, there can be no doubt in that an essential element of a well-functioning democracy is the right to freely express views uh, on, on the government of the day and the decisions that the government makes. As will come as no surprise to most, being a Labor parliamentarian and a former union official, I have myself certainly spent my fair time um, alongside many others, robustly articulating 
uh, our views on certain government decision making that was not in the interest of the workers at all. And work choices was just one example. However, in exercising one's right to freedom of political communication in Australia, it is important that the manner in which this right is exercised is in accordance with the values that underpin our democracy, respect, civility and the rule of law. I condemn without reservation those who seek to articulate their views through violence or the threat of. And as we all do in this place, condemn it without reservation. But there is certainly a place in this country for protests. One might even suggest that such activity enhances the quality of our democracy. What there is no place for, however, is harm or threats thereof to participants in that democracy. And I am appalled to hear of members of parliament, whether it's in this place or in state parliaments, that their families and staff are receiving threats to their lives. We should all be appalled for such acts. This is not what a well-functioning democracy is about. It is our duty, not just as members of this place, but as passionate Democrats to call out this bad behaviour in the strongest possible terms. Now that's what we are doing here today. And I only hope that in due course, we will all join together and also call on the government to do the same without reservation. Failure to do so and being complicit, sorry, failure to do so is being complicit in undermining our democracy. And it gives tactic approval to behaviour which we all know it is, to, it, it is wrong. And it is our duty as legislators to come together and overcome this division. And it is our duty not to tear this place down, not to tear down the fabric of our community. Rather, it is our duty to mend those tears when they do appear. I am disappointed that there are some and, in other, and others in the other place who do not share our commitment to solemn undertaking, and I do hope that in time that they will. And we saw some examples today and, and yesterday, uh, which I do hope will remain as a one-off. We can and should be very proud of the democracy which we as Australians have built here in this country. Indeed, unlike others, we have, for the most part, been spared the perils of political motivated violence. Yet such circumstances have not come about through luck. They have come about through deliberate action, through a conscious understanding of the importance of always acting with the purpose of strengthening our democracy, not in tearing it down. You know, and, and these are things that I recall as a young student, not just at school but university, you know, core fundamental principles of respect for one another. And yes, we'll have the argy-bargy that occurs in this place, but when you have actions of members in the Senate and also members in the other place that do put others' lives in danger and their families in danger, you know, you do need to reflect on that and ask why. Is it that you're not able to put forward your arguments articulately in this place? Like, why do you have to resort to violence? Why do you have to resort to putting someone's life in danger. And in my home state, Victoria, recently, many members of the state parliament addresses were leaked. You know, and, and one must ask, why? What are you trying to prove? What are you trying to prove? Like many people in our country, you go and protest and do so peacefully. Do it the steps of parliament, as many, many groups have done for decades on Spring Street. That's what good democracy is about, and I want to make sure that we maintain it that way, Deputy Thank President. Thank you, Senator Giacone. Your time has expired. Senator McMahon. <clears throat> Thank you, um, Madam Deputy President. Um, so I rise to respond to uh, Senators Kitching and Ciccone taking note of um, answers from Senator Birmingham to question asked by Senator Wong. Now, <clears throat> I might be paraphrasing Senator Wong a little bit, but Basically, her question was, why did we, as a government, 
not oppose the motion that was put up. Well, the fact is there was no motion put. So we didn't not oppose, we didn't vote against. There was no motion put to the Senate to vote on. Now, if we turn to some of the, um, the comments made by Senator Kitching um, regarding the issue of, of violent protests and, uh, and violence and unacceptable behaviour, um, you know, we, we did hear from Senator Birmingham. Uh, he said, of course, of course we oppose and condemn um, any form of, of, of threatening or uh, inflicting violence in, in any form whatsoever. So, you know, he did address that. We as a government and we as individuals do, do completely um, oppose uh, threatening or, or violent or insightful behaviour by, by anyone. Um, <clears throat> now, those opposite um, and uh, those in the corner would, would have us believe that this is all right-wing extremism. Um, it's not. Certainly there are extremists out there, right and left-wing and other types, Hello. and we must always take action against extremist, politically motivated violence. And we are. And I'm, I'm pleased to say that um, this year the government has made a record $1 billion investment um, in ASIO's most sensitive capabilities. This is to um, investigate, discover, stamp out, prevent um, and crack down on this kind of extremism and this kind of violence. So we are definitely doing a lot about the issue. But the other thing that we need to look at is why are we seeing this massive rise in, uh, in violence and threats Fortunately, at the moment, is mostly threats directed towards um, people in government, people in public office. Now, none of it's excusable, but those on the other side don't care why. They don't care. Um, we do. On this side, we do. And we recognise that a lot of these people who aren't the extremists are actually pretty normal people who are behaving in a very, very abnormal way, a way that they would not normally behave in. Now, we need to look at what is causing that. Um, I know from, from some of the people that I know in the Northern Territory that are going to these protests, they're not behaving or threatening violence, but they are behaving in a way they would not normally do so. And the reason they have done that is, is absolute uh, frustration and, um, and, and their, their livelihoods being taken away from them by the government. Now, that doesn't excuse what they're doing, but these people need help. Um, they ne we need to intervene before they get to the stage where they feel their only, their only course of action is to, to threaten people. Um, and we are doing that. We are making record investments in mental health. We recognise that a lot of the stresses that people have suffered over COVID have driven them to experience mental health issues. And we are investing in mental health to combat these issues. Those on the other side don't care about mental health. They don't, they're not speaking out about it. They're not committing to investing in it. They don't care about helping people through one of the most difficult and extraordinary times that we will probably ever live through. And we need to acknowledge the impact that, uh, that this disease and that these responses to disease, and, and often it is in the, the state and territory Labor governments that are reacting extraordinarily and um, taking away people's lives and livelihoods. We need to acknowledge that and we need to provide help and support for these people that are experiencing mental illness as a result of the COVID responses. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you very much, President. Well, today we asked the government to support a very simple motion, a motion to call on the Prime Minister and all political leaders to condemn without reservation, without qualification, 
the threats of violence at re recent protests, including in Melbourne. So that sounds pretty simple, right? Well, not simple for the Morrison government, because this government wouldn't even allow that important motion to be put. And on behalf of all Victorians, I have to say that I am completely disgusted by that decision. It is a disgrace that the government would not allow that motion to be put today, that the government wouldn't take the step that was offered to them of offering the leadership that we need for Victoria, for the country, to absolutely, unequivocally, without qualification, without reservation, condemn the violent protests and threats of violence to politicians, to their families and to our democracy. It is a disgrace. And it is Victorians who are seeing the worst of all of this right now. Uh, it is Victorians that are experiencing the violent threats and the disgusting actions of these people who are threatening our democracy in Victoria uh, and uh, the threats that are now, uh, it seems, unfortunately, being spread around the country. Uh, in my home state, we have seen um, attacks on essential workers. We have seen nurses trying to vaccinate people spat on. We have seen protests, as uh, Senator Kitching said, uh, at our shrine, and we have seen the shrine desecrated by violent protesters in Melbourne. Uh, we have seen protesters out the front of the parliament with gallows. We have seen protesters out the front of, of parliament um, with mocked up nooses chanting, hang Dan Andrews, hang Dan Andrews. And all we were asking for today is for the government to support a motion, to support a motion, to allow it to be moved, to show their support for that motion, calling on the Prime Minister and all political leaders to condemn without reservation or qualification these sorts of threats of violence. And they refused. They refused. It is a complete disgrace because what we are seeing is not only members of parliament being threatened in Victoria, we're seeing their families being threatened as well. We are seeing death threats to premiers in Victoria and now in other states as well. We are seeing these protests spread. We are seeing members of parliament in other states as well receiving the same threats uh, and needing protection. Uh, we have speakers at a rally this weekend claiming they would go to any lengths necessary to rid our parliament of these traitorous politicians. So this needs to end. This needs to be put to an end now. Uh, and what we need is for the Prime Minister to stand up. What we need is for the Prime Minister to lead. What we need is for the Prime Minister to get out of the gutter where he is scrounging around for votes right now and actually call this behaviour out, to call it out from the highest elected office in the land, to call it out without reservation, to call it out now, to join us on the Labor side and call out this violent behaviour now. But instead, instead of that leadership, what we have is a Prime Minister who is actively sowing distrust for political gain. That is what we have in this country right now. He is playing a dangerous game with dangerous consequences. He is flirting with the violent protesters in Melbourne. Uh, and he is doing that with his doublespeak. On one side, he is saying, I condemn the protesters. He is saying that. And then exactly out of, the, out of the other side of his mouth, at the same time, uh, he is saying, I understand their frustrations. I understand their frustrations. I understand that they think it's time for governments to get out of people's lives. What we need is leadership, not doublespeak from this Prime Minister. The question is that the Senate take note of the answers by Senator Birmingham. Those of that opinion say aye, against say no, the ayes have it. Senator Waters. 
Thank you, President. I rise to take note of the response to my question uh, to Minister Rustin. Uh, we saw last night duelling announcements about a domestic and family violence commission. And the timing of the government's announcement was very interesting. It was shortly there after the opposition party had made their announcement, and the two announcements were quite similar. Now, tomorrow is the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women, and we've had 38 women already this year killed by violence. That's 38 too many. And uh, hence I asked the minister uh, about these recent announcements, and I was a bit concerned by one element of her response. She seemed to imply, and I'll follow this up, but she seemed to imply that the uh, commission that the government was proposing would somehow be an oversight of frontline organisations. Now, I hope I incorrectly infer that. I hope that's not the case, because what this government needs to do is actually listen to those frontline service workers who are saving women's lives, who are drastically underfunded, who are working well over time on the smell of an oily rag, often at award, weight, award wage pay rates, because they actually are very passionate about keeping women safe. So I, I was just a little bit disturbed that the minister uh, made an offhand remark that I will follow up and hope is not some kind of uh, watchdog role that they intend to play over the frontline services sector to try to stop domestic violence. So that's the first thing that I wanted to place on record. But the other point was, we just had this Women's Safety Summit. Remember the one that was kept on getting delayed and ended up being by Zoom, and in fact it wasn't really an exchange of information, it was just a one-way broadcast. Uh, but anyway, at that summit, one of the statements uh, that was clearly made went to the need for more housing. Now, this shouldn't be news to anyone that's been paying attention to this issue. Women are being forced to choose between violence and homelessness because there is no crisis housing, there is no transitional housing and there is no long-term affordable housing in this country. There's no social housing. Private housing is, is barely any vacancy rates and rentals are through the roof and no one can afford to buy a home anymore. Housing is a key issue for keeping women safe. And so I asked the minister, well and good about this commission, assuming they're not going to just attack frontline workers, but how many roofs will that provide for women escaping violence? So she didn't really answer that question, but hey, it's called question time. It's not called answer time after all. Um, I want to remind the minister that the fastest growing group of homeless people in this nation are women and they're older women to boot. Before COVID, it was women over 55 that were the fastest group headed towards homelessness. Now it's women over 45. So this is a problem that is touching so many of us in this nation. And rather than passing the buck to the states, as this government likes to do, they need to step up and provide real funding so that we have enough homes in this nation to house people that need it, particularly those older women and particularly women that are fleeing violence, and not just long-term affordable housing, that transitional and crisis housing as well. Um, now, I also asked the minister about the uh, investment or lack thereof in prevention programs, and in particular, this government's vexatious and vexed relationship um, with respectful relationships programs in schools. Now, remember the palaver about safe schools? Um, this crew on the government benches just are so torn apart when it comes to providing basic consent education to children to keep them safe um, and teaching them about what a real respectful relationship uh, means, whether that's a same-sex relationship, whether it's a heterosexual relationship, whatever. They, are just, they just can't deal with the notion that we should actually give to kids the tools to keep themselves safe. Um, again, I didn't really get a response from the minister on whether they will stop attacking uh, proper education and consent education in schools and start funding it, um, but this is not the first time we've raised this issue. The last issue I talked about and asked the minister about, again with not really a very good response, was the quantum of funding that needs to be provided so that no one is turned away from a frontline domestic and family violence service when they reach out for help. The sector has clearly said they need $12 billion over 12 years, which is the life of the next national plan. It's a billion a year. This government is providing, on the back of the envelope, my calculations, about 2 per cent of what the sector is asking for. It is not enough. Not a single person that reaches out for help after fleeing violence should be turned away. And that is this government's job to stump up the funds to make sure that those frontline heroes 
have the beds and the personnel to do that job. The question is that the Senate take note of answer given by Senator Rushton. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. We